Greetings, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades. Today, my friends, Royce White and A.J. Barker, join me for a special show on globalism. It's really a third piece, and it is a triplicate on a topic that has been more and more important on the world stage since the passing of Benedict. And news has been out. It's been it's been shocking me by the day that makes some of the things we said on our earlier shows seem all the more true and all the more important. Namely, Benedict the 16th has passed, and we have a book coming around the corner by Georg Ganswein that promises to describe dark maneuvers that seemed to insinuate Benedict was, I don't know, forced out of the chair. That's stuff we've been speculating about for 10 years. Also, an Italian general is out there claiming that the NSA forced forced Benedict out and that the NSA was claiming back in 2005 after the conclave, which gave us Benedict, that they would get him out. So rather than promise that these facts are all veritable, or that they're all vetted, today, Royce and AJ, you guys are going to speculate with me on the world that could have been, the world that we're left with, and what might these facts mean. But but first off, welcome back to the show. Thank you for for being here, the both of you. Thanks for having us. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Pumped to be back. We're happy. Yeah, of course. It's always a, a pleasure to have you guys. And we're having some tech issues this morning that we don't usually have. So first off, would you guys each just mind saying briefly, uh, it could be really brief, what personally to you, the passing of Benedict the 16th means to you? It's, it's weird to have no camera lingo running the funeral of a pope. It's supposed to be a camera lingo. It wasn't. It was another pope. Isn't that just a sign of the weirdness of the times? And then comment on that. And and what does Benedict himself mean to you in his passing? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. So uh, Benedict was uh, the, the turning point for my conversion to Catholicism, reading Introduction to Christianity. I know I'm not alone in that. You know, many other people talk of the same thing. Uh, for me, is you know, about six, seven years ago, I uh, heard a quote from it. And I was like, man, that quote was fire. So then I picked up the book, read it, and it was like page after page of just hitters. And um, and then, you know, fast forward, uh, you've talked about some of the, the Regensburg Address, Space Salvi. Space Salvi is probably one of the best uh, written works that, that I've ever come across. Uh, I mean, yeah, the the dudes, the dudes got it, you know, he had it, uh, he had the, the touch, um, no doubt about it. So, um, I mean, I, I have a, a personal sort of devote now that he's dead, a personal sort of devotion to, uh, to be 16. I yep. think, uh, we've, we've obviously, we've talked about it, uh, a lot, you know, texting back and forth. I, for me, the big question that I just want to resolve, I don't care if it's speculation. I'm not saying I need evidence on this, but like, what's the linchpin that would have moved him to get out if that's there. Otherwise, for me, I still default back to, I'm actually quite convinced this is a very holy man. Not saying you've ever said anything different, but but very holy man that the the sort of the the reality of God penetrated deeply into him. And so I'm I'm I think my read on it is the man didn't want to be Pope in the first place. He was very old. Um, I think he humbly and truly didn't want that as much as like movies like the two popes try and position and and posture as if it was the exact opposite. I actually think he earnestly uh, didn't want to be Pope. And yeah. um, I think that uh, I, I think the second piece of, of the retire retirement was one, when you're old, I mean, I've had it with family members, they think they're going and then, and then they, they kick back up and they go for years and you're like, Oh, well, you know, I, so I think there's one piece of it where he's probably like, drained from everything's going on and he's thinking this is uh waning and then uh you know the lord's like oh, no 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 you're not um i so i think that's piece a piece of it i think the second piece of why he would have retired to me and and this makes sense to me is i think he looked at uh medical technology where it's gotten at where it's able to keep people alive and i think he really thought earnestly that uh in an off ramp for a pope in the case of like being a 
a living vegetable for any number of years would be a good thing. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that because I've, I've said to you also, I think if, if the wheels move slowly for a number of years, um, I don't think that's a bad thing. So even if someone, even if we have a sort of two, three year period where the Pope is, you know, alive, but uh, you know, sort of non-functional, I, I don't think that's the worst thing ever. I, I do think that the carrying that office to death is a, is an important piece of it. Um, but those are the things that come together for me. And, and if he's been moved out, if, you know, the global powers had saying it again, it's like, I'm just like, I, I get that they have a plan that they want to put in place and that their plan is coming into fruition with the, with the modernist agenda. Like I'm on board. I think they do have that. I think they had that. I think they wanted him out. I think all of that's there. Uh, and, and we've also talked about, maybe it's a, maybe it was a, a cowardice. I, I guess I'd want a little more clarity on, on what that cowardice, you know, pertains to, but, um, but I, I just look at it like, it's like, well, what are they telling you? Like, they're going to destroy the church. Like, I'd be like, no, you're not. <laughs> uh, like you're going to, you know, humiliate me, expose my faults. Like, man, if it's the end of your life, like get them out there so that you can uh, rightly confess to them and, uh, and, and, and be a leader in that way. Um, if it's a personal threat on your life, like, that's what Christianity is about, um, is, is death. We, death's been overcome. Death's been defeated. So I, I think, like I said, I think everything around it makes sense. It adds up of everyone else's motives and pushing on him. And then what happens, and then what unfolds after, I think that makes sense. Um, Royce is a, as a reaver. Yeah. What, what do you think? He, this guy tends to be really special to reverts. Uh, me, AJ is saying this, uh, what is what did Benedict mean to you? What does his death mean to you? We can talk about the the speculation and the the implications for globalism afterwards. But I I'm just curious when I talk to people, I'm like Benedict 16. There was a lot of excitement around his pontificate in its first couple of years, three years. It kind of like the Trump presidency for a year until it became a disappointment. What is what does he mean to you? Well. I, I draw back to from the outside looking in, and I don't say outside looking in as a non-Catholic because I was born and raised a Catholic. Um, I'd say outside looking in from being in what we would call a cultural Democrat community, both both in my local community, but also more broadly in, in the liberal audience or liberal you know, edifice of, of mainstream media. And just understanding how Pope Benedict was depicted, right? Um, yep. He certainly had this uh, this mainstream media depiction of being Hitler esque, right? Nazi. That was one of the one of the motifs they used against him, as I can as I can recall. Uh, and and this is this is certainly well before uh, the social media meme sort of boom that we have now, but, but in those places where it was happening, uh, th that was kind of a motif. And, and, and when me and AJ went to talk about him and I looked further into some of his writings and the things that he said, he, for me, uh, represents one of those symbols of, of people who would have, who it would have been great for non-Catholics, atheists, secularists, to much better understand and have a better read of versus what, what was uh, projected from the mainstream media. Um, and, 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 but so too is the case for, for uh, popes before him and, and, you know, in the Catholic church as a whole uh, in the black community, I think, you know, and, and I look at things from that way culturally, cause that's, that's, that's where I'm, that's where I'm from. Um, overall uh, his death is sad. Right. I mean, it, it is a it is a it's a it's a sad moment uh, for Catholics, I think. And, um, you know, we, we look to move forward as best we can. Yeah, I mean, I feel let me just this is an exact I've done, I think, five show, five shows on Benedict <laughs> since the 31st. No, since the 29th of December, I've done five shows on Benedict. I don't I haven't talked a ton about how I feel from a. I mean, you're you're a guy, Royce, who's talked a lot about globalism. And globalism is not something that during the reign of Benedict the 16th, conservatives talked about. I remember right. during those years, you know, the the, the post-Bush years, 
it was terrorism it, you know is islamism this was a big a big uh talking point we were we were talking uh, about you know is obama the first socialist open socialist american president we were not worried about globalism and yet the friends of benedict we're, we're warning him, hey, the globalists are the ones that, that don't want you in office. He comes in and his first major statement is that I may not flee from the wolves of Rome. Right. Uh, that's which ended up being, you know, protesting too much. That's in 2005. Yeah. Yeah. Also yeah. in 2005, there are widespread predictions that he is going to have one of the most short lived presidencies, uh, uh, sorry, pontificates yeah. ever. Yeah. In 05, as soon as he comes in after the conclave, what we didn't know at the time, this is guy doesn't want to flee the wolves of Rome. People are saying he's going to retire within the year. I didn't know who the Sankt Gallen Mafia was. It was a, it's a you know deep church organization. And they are predicting that he will be just an anti-pope, A-N-T-E. Cardinal Martini, I believe use the term an anti-pope for their guy who will give us one world government basically one world government one world religion and uh he'll be kind of in and out but i didn't know this at the time so for the entire pontificate which lasts until 2013 things are changing the paradigm is changing in the popular view and francis comes in and we all thought he was a. Uh, he was a showstopper. We all thought he was a, a shock out of Buenos Aires. It turns out I didn't learn until Francis had been in office for four years until 2017 that Francis Bergoglio had been number two at the 2005 right. conclave. No one knew it, even though, you know, the most probably was this guy, Angelo uh, uh, Scola. And there's a whole backstory on that. I'm going to do a story, uh, a show next week on on what happened with Scola, who was actually announced pope for a, a brief while in 2013 so what is going on with this guy then you find out there's the wef connection that pope francis is actually the first real friend of the world economic forum and this is this is getting to stuff royce you talk about it all the time yeah. then we get to the un bon ki moon is always in and out of this Vatican. Then we get to the pro-life movement, which is dampened by Francis. And of course, population control being the key idea of the globalists, the open, yeah. open conspiracy. Now things start to make sense, but they only make sense retroactively, retrospectively, because we didn't know that all this was going on during Benedict's pontificate. I heard him say the wolves of Rome thing, but I didn't think, I didn't make any anything of it. And then finally, it's more stuff is breaking fast after Benedict finally dies. Fast forward, not to 2013, but to 2022, when we know a little bit about the people that that uh, hated him there in Rome. There's videos you can go watch of him flying into Germany, receive it, being received by all of his brother bishops from Germany, and they're they're snubbing him a handshake. They're all pulling their hands away. We didn't know this was going on. And I think that everything, I'm thoroughly convinced that everything that's happened with Benedict has to do with what you're talking about in the, the deep state. I don't know. AJ might not be convinced. What, what do you, well, where are you on that, Royce? When I think of globalism, I think of <clears throat> two, two different forms. Um, I think of direct conspiracy and then the coalescing of evil spiritedness um, at the metaphysical level. Uh, and I think there's an interplay between both. And, and, and I respect, I respect the power of Satan enough to know that he can weave in and out of both uh, as necessary for a greater agenda. Um, I think what, what, what victory Satan has won in the short term is that people have become so uh, disenfranchised, for lack of a better term, uh, when it comes to global matters or when it comes to matters of, uh, let's say, constrained power, um, that we are hopeful for false prophets. 
I mean, the willingness to accept false prophets uh, is, in my opinion, at an all time high. And it was a ground that we seated ourselves by not being active where we should have, when we should have, where we should have said no. Uh, and and another, another huge part of that is uh, people in certain positions of power have a, a, a power that is accepted given the, the historical context or gravitas of their position. You know, it could be the Pope, it could be the Speaker of the House, it could be the President of the United States, it, you know, it could be the experts on COVID-19. I mean, there's all this sort of sort of uh, gravitas and credentialization that we want to trust. We want to trust deep in our heart. And it, that that's a perversion of historicity, which, in my opinion, is right up Satan's alley, right? Yeah. Is to, to, to weaponize um, the utility of history itself, of, of, of uh, historicity against a, a vulnerable populace that is weak uh, morally, right? And, and I think of the story of David uh, and, you know, David walks walks onto the battlefield and says, look, I don't care what the score is between mm -hmm. us and them, the giants, or, you know, I don't, I don't care what, I'm slaying this guy tomorrow through faith in God. And I, I may be one of the younger amongst you, but I still, I still have that faith. Uh, I think a lot of us have lost that. And you can look at our United States Congress as an example of a, um, a body of people that is a reflection of our desire to trust in elders. Right. Uh, right. I think a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of the deep state and the deep church's ability to maneuver the way they have comes from that. It stems from that desire to, to, to trust in our elders. Um, but, but the boomer generation is just completely out of control. I mean, they're, they're out of control spiritually, they're out of control politically, uh, and and some of the, the the ideas that have erected and and really took in root in the boomer generation should keep everybody up at night. Now, let, let's think about the the WEF and the, the globalism thing more directly from a political standpoint. In my opinion, one of their great one of their great strategies is to keep people's to, to lock in on a thing and give you that thing through mainstream media institutions and get you spinning on that one thing while they work all the other angles. And slowly there's a progression towards a more coalesced power. Uh, and, and you're right. It was terrorism and Islamism and, you know, many, many uh, Catholics, many Christians in America, but around the world bought this narrative that that Islam is the great the great evil uh and you know it's not that Islam doesn't have huge problems and it's not that Islam is you know uh, is Islam terrorism isn't a, isn't a threat yeah but 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 John F Kennedy told us when we fought communism when communism was on the table that the that the the desire to 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 enhance a security state uh in, in order to defeat communism at the time will be used and weaponized by those that mean to expand it to its full capabilities. And, and that's what global, I mean, glo the globalists shot John F. Kennedy and they took everything that he was warning people about and they just did it. And, and people were frozen in front of their TVs. They still are. Many of the boomers are still frozen in front of their TVs. And they said, there's more for us to get to look away. And, and we had a, a, a much smaller uh, intelligence community that expanded to a 20 branch intelligence community with more expansive powers that then became the five eyes that then can circumvent and undermine any constitutional law. And then we got a bunch of right wing conservative Republicans that talk about the rule of law when it comes to George Floyd. I mean, it's just like, that's a cop out, you know, and I'm not saying that the rule of law isn't important when it comes to petty crimes or when it comes to drugs or when it comes to the border or, or any, anything else. But let's not pretend that our desire to keep the focus around the petty crimes is because we lack the courage to fight big institutions. And, and that is where globalism has taken root around the world is there's this kick the let's kick the can on the big fight. Let's let's ruminate on this on this petty on the petty. Uh, and and so, yeah, like I, I think of this when it, when I think of the, the the Islam example that you're you're given. Nothing, nothing signals clearer to me how globalism functions and the strategy than the Kurds, right? I mean, 
the Kurds are are uh, the Kurds are in many ways the bastion of what people think of when they think of radical Islam, right? Uh, you know, the, the the Kurds are you know that group of conventional traditionalists, uh, non-modern conforming tribesmen, right? That that uh that have really controlled their own sovereignty there on a five country border um, in, in the modern world. And they've, be, they've, they fought in Russia, they fought Great Britain, they, they, they fought in America now, and they've, they've not lost yet because of their faith. Now, here's the, here's the catch, and there's always a duality. Um, they take payoffs, right? So they, they are actually presented, this is how crazy and deep it gets, they are presented as the ones who don't compromise or, 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 you know, who don't compromise their values against the West, but they are the highest form of controlled opposition. You understand what I'm saying? Because yeah. we, in, we empowered the Kurds. We used the Kurds. And, and, I, and I'm not, and here's, here's how funny, how funny it really gets. Who were the Kurds? Where'd they come from? The Kurds? We're Jews. They, I mean, I mean, that's how weird this really gets. The really? Kurds are, the Kurds are, they originated, they believe, and many accounts believe that the Kurds uh, originated from the, the 12 tribes of, of Israel. Uh, and that's where they, many of them believe their origin, their origin is. Uh, but now they've become more Muslim over the years, but they're like 50, 50, I think. Right. And the leader of the Kurds is a Jew. His name is Don Barzini, which is super funny that his name is Don Barzini. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Not but probably. yeah, the, the leader of the Kurds is a Jew. So, I mean, and, and I don't know what to make of that other than I know that the prevailing mainstream narrative for most people in the West is that we have to fund Israel or else the, the threat of radical Islam will overrun Israel and destroy it. Uh, and, and some of that may be true, but when you move a little bit to the, uh, you know, you move a little bit over on the map, you find a place where Jews and Muslims have come together in this strange tribe of people that, that, that control this area around five countries. And nobody even talks about that part. Hmm. I mean, there's such gaps, such wide gaps of information and in people's uh, prevailing thoughts about geopolitics uh, that that we are we have, first thing we have to do I think is to accept that we are children right now, yeah. fighting against this. When we talk about globalism, I mean we have mm -hmm. not even begun to wrestle with the 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 breadth of things they have working, uh, and, and and but but that shouldn't discourage us. That shouldn't have us default back to well. Let's talk about George Floyd being on fentanyl. I mean I can't tell you how many times I get personally. You, know, you let it protest about George Floyd. Yeah, I went to the Federal Reserve. Where were you? Where have you been ever? Where were you at any point in time to fight or speak out against these things in any real way? And, and, and the, the energy, the momentum is just like Fox News or any other number of conservative shills out there. And so when you really look at it, I go back to a guy like, um, what's our guy's name? The fourth political theory. Dugan. Alexander Dugan. Oh, he gets this so right. He's like conservatism and liberalism in America is two different. It's just two forms of liberalism. And I can hear it at the farthest end of the right spectrum. Right. And it's not the, the concession of morals or beliefs or ideals. It's the rumination on the petty. Where is the courage? Where is the, you know, where is the, the, uh, the willingness to go into the unknown and find a knowledge or find the information or find a pathway to real change. Right. And so it's like, yeah, at the center, the centrists, you know, they, they are the stronghold of the corrupt status quo, but on both sides of the outer wall, they are the, they are the first line of defense for the new world order. These people in here are the new world order. The centrists are the new world order. They're running the, the they're running the show. Right. The McCarthy's yeah. and Hakeem Jeffries, they're running it. They're 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 it. They're getting the call straight from Davos. But the people who pose as the opposition, 
those are the people that we need to, uh, you know, take off of the, off of the, uh, off of the high wall, um, because they're, they're, they're running, they're running cover. So, I mean, that's a way out there, you know, explanation. I, I, I you know, might've ram, r- rambled on, but it bothers me because I'm in the conversation constantly in this house speakership and all of these things and Pope Benedict's dying. And I, I, I'm looking at these things and seeing it. And I'm going, why are people talk? Why do, why do we choose to talk about the most petty? That's a reflection of us. That's a reflection of us not wanting to really change it. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and really the globalists, they're not really hiding all they're doing. They just got a really big head start on us. So we, we got to actually take the field where it is. And we don't do that yet. Yeah, just, Royce, did you ever did you ever listen to that three and a half hour YouTube video? I think I sent it to both you and AJ uh, mm-hmm. by M- Myron Fagan about the formation of the Council on Foreign Relations. That to me, that's like the starting place. If you say we're babies on foreign policy, it's always been my weakest, my weakest area when we're talking ideologies, foreign policy. No one know we're all babies. Start there, Council on Foreign Relations uh talk by myron fagan and go from there to to me if we're gonna embark on this conversation i mean not uh, as conservatives as catholic conservative americans then we have to start there what what was the council on foreign relations um yeah we we should do a a show just well no i mean i think I, i think it's even you know i here's here's the deal i think america and America's military and America's scientific and technological prowess has become the battering ram for the new world order. We are hijacked. We're not living in the United States of America. This is why, like, like for example, when Colin and Colin Kaepernick's awoke and he's weak and he he allowed himself to be used, he allowed himself to become this symbol of of contradiction uh, and and. Uh, there's a lot of couple, but but when what I what I watched happen with him is when he kneeled knelt for the when he kneeled, and the conversation about our identity as Americans was called into question, a bunch of people in the conser- in the conservative movement cucked, they cucked. They go, you you need to be proud to be an American. It's like, well, which America? There's America, the ideal that we fail to live up to, in the conservative viewpoint, <laughs> not 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 in the liberal viewpoint. We fail to live up to America's ideals in the conservative viewpoint from a government standpoint, which is a reflection of us. And they say, you know, you should be proud. It's like, what country are y'all living in? No, you, no. The reason why you should have an animus towards the American identity and the status of your citizenship isn't because we're not LGBTQ, black or feminine friendly enough. So that's not why we should have an animus. But there's an animus to have. There's a grievance to have. And so why didn't the conservatives coalesce around the situation and go, no, no, you know what? You, we, we should call into question the identity of America and the identity and, and, the, and the question of our patriotism. But here's where it should be. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. And the neocons and the conservative movement <laughs> have run, run for that, you know, run that controlled opposition for a long time. And, and it stems back to a very, very, central view of the world that the neocons and the conservatives embraced. We don't have a foreign policy in America. It's, it's a lie. The whole thing is a scam. There is no foreign, there is no genuine American foreign policy. We were pulled into world war II. We went from an isolationist thriving country and we were pulled into World War II. And after World War II, when Germany and Japan and the, and the Axis powers were defeated, we adopted two foreign policies, Japan's and Germany's. And really, what people don't realize is that Germany's foreign policy, Germany at the time, you could argue, was, was the battering ram for the crown. And I keep going back to this. It's just, it's, it's just astounding that people don't make the connection. Why did you see George and Hitler palling around? And, and I mean, the, the concessions that were given to Germany by Great Britain in, in World War II and World War I are, are right there. I mean, they helped them. It was Hitler's dream was to bring Great Britain into the war against Russia. 
and you can't trust the Brits, right? So the Brits sat back and said, well, we're an island. We're, we're pretty comfortable with our ability to defend ourselves against all of you guys. We got the trade routes. We're the power here. So let's see what happened. Let's see if he can actually pull it off. And then you had Winston Churchill come in. And then Winston Churchill kind of kind of uh, signals a, a real key, ch- a real sea change in Great Britain's position on foreign relations on geopolitical matters. And, w- and Winston Churchill had a thing for Hitler. He's like, nah, nah, nah. I don't trust this guy at all. Nothing about him. And so when Churchill comes in and takes the reins, then the war really becomes, uh, you know, becomes one between Hitler and Churchill. Right. And what did Churchill say about the state? And just to add this context, what did Churchill say about the state of Israel? He goes, oh, we got to We got to create the state of Israel. It'd be good business for us to create the state of Israel in the fight against communism, because by creating a, a Jewish state, we can pull the Bolsheviks out of Russia. This is right. And he, he wrote this. He, he, this is a public letter that he wrote. My what point does that is, mean, though? I, I've, I've heard that. So he's saying. All of all of the Bolsheviks he's saying he, what he was saying without saying it. He wrote a full expose about three types of Jews, the international Jew, the faithful Jew, and then the, 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 the revolutionary Jew is basically what he was trying to get at. Uh, and, and he would he, he, he I thought he laid it out pretty clean. I thought he gave the, the variety of Jewish identity its proper credence. And but what he what he was saying is that there is this communist threat in Russia that is the real threat of all of Europe and maybe all of the world. And and what he was saying without saying it is that the Bolshevik Jew is at the head of that communist movement. And by creating a Jewish state, we may be able to disrupt the Bolshevik movement by pulling Bolshevik Jews to to their own homeland. Yeah, but by shifting the internationalism to nationalism. That's right. That's right. And, And so, and so I bring that up because America was pulled in to a war that had deep, deep historical roots. And we walked out of the war with no foreign policy. We defanged Germany. We defanged Japan. Where are we today? We're still fighting the same war against Russia that we were fighting then. And who is our other uh, arch nemesis? China. And China and Japan had their war. And I'm not saying that Russia is not a threat. And I'm certainly not saying that China is not a threat because China is a threat. But all I'm saying is that when it comes to foreign policy, we're like a bot. We're like a bot out there in the wilderness just carrying water. Right. And, and, and that's my honest opinion of it. Um, now, do, are there predators in there that see their their, uh, you know, their chance? to to grab the wheel of power and get what they want out of it. Yeah, yeah, of course. And and those people are probably Americans or they're, you know, metropolitan international omnisexuals. Yeah, I get that. Um, yeah. but but what I'm saying is that from a historical standpoint, America has no foreign policy and the conservative movement fails to realize the implications of that lack of foreign policy. Yeah, I yeah. think it- here, let, let me jump in. I think uh, the, the lack of foreign policy uh, speaks to a lack of identity. And, and so much of our problems right now stem from a lack of identity. They, you, can't, you cannot navigate uh, a border situation, a sense of sovereignty, um, a sense of maybe healthy respect, healthy pride, like, like the... the, the, the um, the pride, the the pride in one's nation that is a, a consequence of justice, which one one owes the nation as providing them goods which they can't uh, provide for themselves, and the the history of that too, a sort of a sort of you know a default out of justice one owes that to them. You can't even have that when you don't have an identity. Now it's it's good to have try and salvage through that as much of a sort of you know pride in an ancestry, some sort of line that's brought you to where you are that's outside of your control. Right. And that's, uh, uh, you know, the filial devotion of children to their parents. Um, you know, uh, that that's all that that's there. But you see so many people, so many people, right, unable to reconcile these things. I'll tell you what, if you have a fake patriotism, you're not you're not servicing justice. You're certainly not servicing the the sort of um, deeper virtuous 
uh, 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 potential benefit that can come from that. There's a potential benefit that comes from from right worship, uh, from from right honoring of parents, right honoring of country. Um, I think it it lies at the heart of the the liturgical wars too, um, which I I have probably a slightly different um, opinion than than um, the the full traditional side. Though I think uh, I, I mean we, we'll talk about that another time. But um, but again, how one worships does matter. Whether you fulfill that piece of of the human the human being oriented toward justice, toward God, and how you think of your nation state. I've, I've said it on this show before. I don't much understand how the Midwest, the Northeast, the Southeast, the South, and the West Coast are all just one conglomerate, you know, sort of like nation identity, which, by the way, isn't even constrained just to those ones I've said. It also then has the the global influx, the sort of, uh, it, you know, professed immigrant identity of America that it that it has. I don't know how one uh, has a patriotism toward that and it's substantive whatsoever because it doesn't include anything that that culture would have included, which is sort of a linguistic territory, a sort of architectural, um, artistic sort of territory, some sort of thing that that is more than just saying the words USA, um, you know, praising the words USA. It has to have some substantive things you're pointing to that you're taking pride in. Am I taking yeah, like pride? bioclimatic vegetative zones? Like yeah. what kind of crop do you grow? Of course. Yes, of course. yes. Yeah. What foods you eat? I mean, literally all this. I don't know how you look at an all glass building in, in a downtown area and go, oh, yeah, that's that's that's, that's, me. that's my identity. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's you know what America. I mean? Like, and so so I look at that and it's like, yeah, if, if we don't have foreign policy and, and it is it is an important linchpin in this, we can't even begin the process of forming what our nation is. And so what you're you're getting and, and this is this is so clear. What you're getting is just a run on the wealth that is available right now. And that's what uh, the person who applies for political office, the person who applies for a journalist role, person who applies for a government role. They're trying to grab what's there because there's a big pot. Of of material goods, they're trying to make a run on that, and uh, and they're saying, yeah, well, of course, we'll go wherever the winds need to go, and we'll even act as if we're representing people. Um, yep. But but yep. that's that's what 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 you're seeing is uh, is the disintegration of a country, a sort of uh, pseudo false intentions to want to be an empire, which isn't in the the sort of constitutional structural DNA of this place, but it's that that's the the yearning is this sort of uh, imperialistic empire uh, yearning. What you're seeing is that just get flooded and disintegrated to nothing. It's exactly why you have an opioid crisis on one end, uh, a marital crisis on another end, uh, uh, homicide, suicide crisis on another end. You have these weird, we were talking about, Royce and I were talking about this the other day. You have these weird offshoots of crimes that I, I definitely think have a, a psycho social, psycho cultural aspect of both. Uh, mass shootings, terrorist events, um, weird, weird sort of things going on, and 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 all this speaks to a disintegration of of the the psychological ra- reality of not just the individual, but the individual within a community and the communal one. And so, the, it, it is worth saying a foreign policy is is actually very much so a right place to start to identify to realize who you are. And Tim, I think you'll like this. But Aristotle, I always love reading the beginning of Aristotle's uh, treatises, whatever they are, uh, you know, on the soul, the physics, whatever it is, because at the beginning is when he kind of you get the most sort of profundity in the in the highest dosage early on. But so I think it's it's the physics and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but he just starts off by like uh, we all know uh, very little at first and we come to perfection of knowledge as we go. And um, so it fits actually. The, the process of developing an identity to go like, you know, broad, okay, what's our, what's our foreign policy? Like what's our uh, orientation toward the other countries in the world and, and our identity as, as a country within a, a landscape of multiple countries in, a, in a, a, a human race? Like what, what's, what's our orientation toward that? All right. If we start to square out some principles on that, some identity on that, well, then we're actually going to be able to navigate a lot of these things just uh, instinctually much better, much more effectively, much more in line with um, what actually brings about, uh, uh, you know, a real flourishing, not just of the individual that I mean, of communal, 
you know, communal formations of people, which we, we do not, we, we have that, that is so bastardized right now, communal formations. Oh, and it's, it's so disintegrated. And, and, and not only is it bastardized in a philosophical sense from a nation or government, but it's actually intentionally bastardized through technology. Right. There. Yeah. No. And I was yeah, going to say, I was going to say the other from. No, I was going to have a state and government I, I, to now the individual identity is bastardized through the isolation of technology. You're picking up right where I was going next is that uh, and part of it, it to, you know, sort of olive branch, though, it's not an actual olive branch is uh, is to say that, um, you know, the advent of technology and global travel, I, I you can't say enough. The idea that you can travel across the world and communicate with people, even if you never do it, <laughs> even if you never do it, um, that's enough for the imagination of man to just take one step out and go, okay, now I'm dealing in, in real terms, but my imagination gets to broaden its scope to here. And uh, that's enough for people to start really going crazy, so to speak, yeah. just having wild ideas. And, and it was enough for them to go, yeah, I have no idea what America is. Because I can see all these people. I see a video from all these places. And why aren't they just a part of me? And now the lack of identity that I have here, the lack of cultural identity, the lack of like you, agricultural identity, the lack of uh, artistic, um, architectural identity, linguistic identity, religious worship identity, the lack of that identity now. And then it, it combines with crisis. like, oh, we have planes flying yeah. and we have uh, images from other places and I can communicate over here, even if they never do it. I've never talked to someone, uh, you know, in the Eastern part of the world ever in my life, but just the possibility of it existential crisis. is enough for uh, my brain to start go, Ooh, let's, uh, let's start theorizing about what, <laughs> you know, what, what America now is. This, this, this is, this is, and I, if I can, I want to want to piggyback too, because this, this is what globalism really is, is a, is a conversation about borders and the existential it, nature of, and, and the borders, right? People think of borders like, we got to stop letting the Mexicans come in. It's like, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, no, we definitely should get a hold of the border. There's no doubt our Southern border, but I'm worried about our Northern border as well, you know, cause China's putting police stations in Canada. Uh, but, but, uh, you know, the, the borders have always been thought of in a political sense. I think of the borders in a spiritual sense. I think. Hey, can, I, can I throw one thing yeah, in? Yeah. I, cause you were saying the failure of globalism is, uh, is a disorder of the imaginative faculty. I, I think at the heart of it, it is, it is a, in, an intemperance in how one utilizes their imaginative faculty. Mm. Right. What yeah. they sort of project out as, as uh, bodies absent as you know, Aquinas and Aristotle would point to the imaginative faculty as, as represented, representing, right? Memory is bodies past, uh, the, the common sense is bodies present, uh, the imaginative faculty is bodies absent. That faculty, the disorder in that faculty mm. is the root of global, it's the root of the globalism of the people as race that are directing it. And it's the root of, root of the problem of the, the passive people coming along that just, uh, I guess, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it it takes and and it's going to take it even more in our world of tomorrow, world of today, and the world of tomorrow. It takes AI. even more temperance, <laughs> more. It takes more formation and virtue for one to be able to be relatively well comparative to a time previous in the past. I, I think the threshold for how much virtue you needed to be relatively stable was was lower in the past. It's now higher. Um, and it is, it's the perfection of those different faculties. It's being able to have the wherewithal to go, okay, in what way is this? Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's uh, feasible possible, but have I ever, have I ever talked to someone, you know, in China? Have I ever talked to someone in name the place? There's 8 billion people in the world. How many people have I actually interacted with? I don't know, a couple hundred, a couple thousand tops. Like that needs to constrain how I think about things. That actual so reality. Can we, needs can to we all agree? At a baseline level, something I say to the nationalists um, that localism is to nationalism as nationalism is to globalism, meaning that subsidiarity, this this concept that that Pius XI gave us in 1931 in Quadragesi Moano, which is really yep. just live where you're at, live in your bioclimatic vegetative zone. 
And that's your world. That ought to be your world. And as Heidegger says, technology alienates us from that world. That, yep. that means that if, if you live in a nation that's too geographically large, which yep. is what the, the anti-federalists all thought, the, the nation of these five or six bio bioregions were it's exactly what you guys just said that this is this is mythic man the the bio regions can't all be one nation they each should be their own nation then necessarily you're engaging in proto-globalism i mean nationalism over the scale of a continent or a, a semi you can't have an identity based on that right you can't have any substantive identity based on that Identity is based be, on you can be a little more. Yeah, you can be a little more than like your your six block neighborhood. Like you could be more than right. that. And right. maybe even like your state territory, you could be more than that. But like you said, those five sort of bio regions, that's an identity. The Midwest. The Midwest is an identity. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it has a it's substance. It's a big one. It. And that, that's a big it is. one. I, I, it is. Because I mean, Aristotle and Plato thought the ideal city Smaller. was fifty thousand or a hundred thousand, but they they didn't just. That's not what a polis was. I think. See, I think this is the fundamental paradox at the heart of the experiment. Uh, American. Let's, let's say this, people, but let's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Sorry, pe people say it's race. People say it's space. I, I say it's 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 really neither. It's the idea that we tried to extend our identity over all this space and you you can't do it i think what you need is a polis a, a city state that you really identify with and you're like this is my guy royce white aj barker i want to live near these guys not only do i want them to be my neighbors because they're fellow catholics but I, I want them to be only guys that are like them that talk like them and and sound like them to be my countrymen and i once you get the idea that a republic is never, ever, ever supposed to be big, much bigger than a hundred thousand person city. You get the idea that the only the, the psyop is pluralism, and I don't, yeah, I don't really care well, about. I, I'm not, I'm not complaining about ethnic pluralism nearly, nearly, nearly to the extent that religious and moral pluralism doesn't work. And that's what was sold to us. And you go read Madison's Federalist 10. He says, oh, you're going to have lots of factions if you get a nation this big. But the solution to it is more faction. I say this is the original psyop. It's the original betrayal of Thomas Jefferson at the heart of the American experiment was the Louisiana Purchase. We're, we're too big. And what's really scary to me, this is why mm, I'm trying to persuade Royce to get into the <laughs> presidency as soon as he's able when he's 35 get into the race next i guess 08 or or, or, or uh, 28 28, 28 sorry yeah is there's no one talking about it it's scary to have a clown world with leftists running it a globalist democrat party the republicans basically uniparty you know kevin mccarthy that was my representative in in southern california which is a nightmare and then the dissident right are just these nationalists that are saying more of the same. You talk about guys like Adrian Vermeule, and they're still saying they're all operating within the same paradigmatic framework. And I have paradigmatic impasse with Democrats, Republicans, and now the new nationalist dissident right, because I'm like, we need to break the whole thing up. And I'm not trying to be salty. We need to believe as Americans in subsidiarity the way we once did that when when there was a robust state's rights and you know guys like george mason one of the fathers of this country were like shouldn't shouldn't even the 13 colonies be broken up into four states that's what needs to start someone's got to start saying this stuff yeah yeah, yeah yes yes and no and i agree with you all things fair but the problem is, is that um the inception of our nation and the progression of our nation to its full body that exists now was a uh, was all attuned to the drums of war. So, and 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 the, and the the drums of war proliferated and pushed technology to the place where we now have a much different international landscape than we did at the time when our country was founded, and the threat of war. And the threat of of military conflict is much greater than it was at that time. At that time, you could be a small you you could remain Jamestown, 
I mean, be- okay, hold on, hold on. Like, yeah, let me jump in because okay. I think this is a perfect point. I was, as Tim was saying, I was thinking this, and now you saying it, it's like, I think the polis point to be made with these sort of incursions of technology is for it not to be the hundred thousand people, but for it to be those regions. The Midwest would be a formidable region. Yeah, it would be able to be both concentrated. And one way I think of it is like, if you live in Chicago, if you live, you know, in Iowa, if you live in Minnesota, if you live in Wisconsin, like even just climate climate wise you you know that you're living in the same type of area you know if i if i travel to down south i'm like this is way different and if they come up in the winter what's the first thing they say i couldn't live here right what's the the person who's lost that identity here in the midwest what do they say oh i gotta get out of this cold right yeah. what does someone what does someone born in the midwest do when it gets cold they're like oh sweet I get to play hockey. I get to go sledding. I get to go, you know, skiing, snowboarding. Like, you know, they have outdoor activities they do that they're like, no, I can't do this if it's sunny out. And I actually like doing those things. So, no, I'm, I'm happy that winter's here. What is right. someone who gets transplanted in from the South? They go, dude, I'm depressed. Yeah. The days are shorter. It's cold outside. I have nothing to do. I know that that's a really, you know, tangible, you know, small resolution example, but I think it's, it's sort of profound in its implications. That yeah, like you literally the just polis a, a is quick slightly story. bigger now. <laughs> well, I was I was you guys know I was at the Nets Pelicans game last night. Afterwards, I was outside looking. Uh, at, I was I started talking to TJ Warren. You know, I'm like I don't know where this dude's from, what part of the country he's from. You know, in in high school and college, but we were all all the people in New Orleans were all bundled up because it was 48 <laughs> or something outside. He was out there in a T-shirt. And I was like, this is so odd. He's at least now become acclimated yeah. to New York weather, which is much, much, much colder, suffice to say. And he's out there in a T-shirt and the rest of us were talking, I guess I'm a TJ too. We were talking to him and um, friendly, friendly guy. And it's like, yeah, man, this is completely unnatural. You fly in for one game, you're flying out for yeah. another game tonight. This is bizarre. And it's all under the auspices of one nation under God. You're uh, aside yeah. from 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 the Raptors. Yeah. Of whoa, 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 so whoa, let me last throw in whoa. that it's like to me, the the scope, the bound is like, no, it's not where, where you fly to, because guess what? You know, you can't check that many bags. You can't bring that much. Stuff. But like if you can go on a road trip to somewhere and it's like, you know, four five, six hours, seven hours. By the way, back in the day, a populace. Uh, if, if, if you wanted to travel 30 miles, like you got to you got to load up the 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 carriages you know you got to get strapped up it's going to take you a day to to get there and that's for yeah like 30 35 miles so i think it's reasonable that our natural extension would now be slightly bigger and then you have that in context with the international scene it would still fit in so yes maybe it's the the hundred thousand gets slightly expanded but not expanded to a point where you're not doing the same sorts of human things the same sorts of human interactions here now here's what i'll say I'm not so concerned. I, I I believe in the identity of America as it was written and, and prescribed by the founding fathers, constitutionally, ideologically. I think that it's right. I think that it's it's proper. I think that it's it, it's it's scalable. So, when I think of America, I don't think of America as the borders that we have now. Although I I understand there's a physical practical border, I think of America as the free people everywhere and how society should be run, a nation of shopkeepers that is always protected, that protects itself uh, through the Second Amendment by the right to bear arms with with the one true God uh, granting us these inalienable rights. Uh, I, th- I think that I think that America would be proper at the global scale, the idea of America. What well, I, the structure, not even just the, the idea, structure. the structure of yeah, the structure it, where of the it. federal federal powers have so little to do. They literally get to like regulate tariffs. Yeah, I, I mean, you <laughs> know, so so my, and so I'll say this: I think there's a war that must be fought. <clears throat> I think you know, in the fog of war, the uh, the directive changes what one's scope should be based on what needs to be done. Uh, and and there's a war to be fought against these globalists, and the war isn't going to be. Trust me, right now, and, th- and this is this is how chess and you know risk and and war works. It's it's a three dimensional, four dimensional board. Right now, if we just decided to shrink down 
and and become more localized, in my opinion, um, the globalists would descend and wipe us out. This was the fear that the original 13 colonies had of the crown. This is part of the reason why slavery, which many of the original 13 colonies wanted out of the original Declaration of Independence and founding documents, this is why they didn't do it. They didn't opt for it because the crown was uh, was lev was leveraged on the business of slavery, which they still are today. And the, the entire modern society is still a three pronged business model, drug, slavery and piracy. Um, but but the United States said, well, <clears throat> if we do this, the crown has the power to wipe us out. So they waited until they had the United States of America. And 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 the, and and then they and then we fought a war. I mean, we had, you know we we fought a war yeah, against yeah. the crown for 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 that for that sovereignty, and and so we had to clear that hurdle first. And so what what I'm saying, is, so I follow. It's like you're you're not saying that uh, we have to first balkanize. You're saying first let's get the American identity right, and then maybe first let's win the war. Yeah, first let's get this. No, well, first let's fight the war. Let's win the war. That might take a hundred years. Yeah, that might take 50 years. It may take 25 years. It maybe it takes 10. I don't know. I, I'm not precluding any miracles. But first, let's actually admit there's a war to fight and let's fight that war, not against the Pashtuns or the Kurds or against the 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 the, the Russian oligarchs or or against the, you know, the the, the, the uh, whoever. Right. It, let's let's fight the war that the real war. Let's get to going on that. And if we clear that hurdle, now we can talk yeah. about the American identity. Because the the inception of the American identity came together through the drums of war, but it started a war machine that is not turned off and has never had a proper aim. Right. So there's a war out there that needs to be fought in the most spiritual existential way, but still in the real physical world. There's a war out there that has not been cashed in. That's proper. There's a proper war and it should be fought. And then the American identity will be clarified and then we can balkanize. Right. Who is the, the war with? Oh, Who's globalism. The, the globalists. 100%. It's, it's with globalists. Yeah, but where, Royce? Where are oh, they? Ukraine? Oh, well, no, I, th well, <laughs> no I, think, well, I think there are three distinct hotspots. And I think they all, they all follow the crown's model. Uh, <clears throat> I think they're in the Ukraine. And Russia, and it's not against the Russians. It's not the Ukrainians. It's against the party of Davos. It's against the global metropolitan interest. Okay, right there in Israel, and right there in China. And and it's not in. It's not between Japan and China. It's between. It's in Kashmir. That's the tinderbox. Um. So so I think there are three distinct places where war will happen, and war will maybe need to be won, fought, and won. But what are the what are the auspices of the war? Like, here's my problem. And I hear the, the, the conservatives talk about this, too. Oh, we got to protect Taiwan. Oh, we can't let Joe Biden let China take Taiwan. Why are we pretending? I mean, th these these psyops are outrageous. We need a little shithole country in the middle of China to make our microchips. And that's why we have to have this international. No, if we want to fight a war with China. If we have decided that China is our existential enemy because they don't believe in God or because they're, they're, tech, they're, they're, uh, they're technocrats or because they're authoritarian, great, fine, because they don't believe in freedom or they believe in countrywide surveillance, populist-wide surveillance, but we believe in those things. <laughs> see, you see what I mean? You see how the, the, the inability for us to clarify the, the current conflicts that we actually have undermines our own position here at home. It, it doesn't allow for us to have a national identity. So and here, here's, here's where I think we should. I, I'm still not sure who we're fighting, though. No, who are we fighting? Well, we, we'll, <laughs> well, the first thing we need to fight is the international banking cartel. Okay. That's a war. That's probably, that's probably numero uno. Um, that would actually take care of a lot. We should probably just go to war on the international banking cartel. We should just bust that all the way up. Um, and I mean, through force. So that that's one. Um, secondly, if the party of Davos still would like to rally around the fragments of the international banking cartel, then we should force them into a position where they have to fight 
fight for their ability to do the things that they've been doing. Fight to defend the idea of globalism. And maybe they win. I mean, I'm not saying what the outcome is going to be. I'm just saying what the actual lines are versus what we say they are. And so one of the things that I hear in the conservative movement often is, is like, um, you know, well, you know, the, the, you know, we have to protect this border or this border, or it's like, look, a border is an existential, uh, is an existential boundary on man's unfettered ambitions, unfettered. That's what borders really are. And you only really have a border in your country so far as the people are willing to identify with it and fight and die for it. That's really what a border is. And if you don't have that in the wide body of populace, then you don't really have a border. I mean, so our borders are a, a, a fugazi. They don't exist because we're totally, not only are we willing to let the people come in from Mexico because we want to get high, let's be honest, and we want low cost labor, but we also want to get high and smoke dope. And we're willing to let it come in from Canada because I don't know, we're, we're, we're virtue signaling that we're amenable to the Canadians and the Canadian identity. I don't know what that's about, but more, more at home, yeah, I don't even know what that's about. But but more at home, we're willing to just import Chinese products. All these conservatives out there are saying, oh, we're selling out to China. We're selling. Nobody wants to invest in an alternative economy. Nobody wants to bring manufacturing home. Nobody wants to wants to put a stop on the fourth industrial revolution. We're giving it away. So it's, it, but then we want to go to war with the Pashtuns over radical Islam. Or then we want to go to war with, with I mean, come on, guys. It's just, it's just a jerk off, you know, and it, it, it bothers me because it's like anybody rational can see where the, where the battleground is. The battleground is against the rise and proliferation of technology and those that mean to usher it forward without constraint. Who are those people? It's clear. The banking cartel benefits. The technocrats, the, the, the faithless, the atheists, they benefit from it. China right now is, is in a position to benefit greatly from it. America's on the decline. So whatever national identity we're trying to protect, as loose as it may have been, and, and, and as loose as it may have carried across time, we're giving it away altogether now. So then don't wait till Colin Kaepernick says, hey, hey something's wrong with this country, and then stand up and go, you know what, F him. No, F you. I mean, I don't, I don't agree with his formulation or his articulation. I think he failed miserably. But at least he threw a rock out there in the water. Most of these people are cucking like, yeah, you know, we, we got to give the NSA unlimited surveillance potential or else the, 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 the Muslims are going to show up in our homes and, and convert our children to Islam. I mean, how faithless of a Catholic do you have to be to believe that the proliferation of Islam will overrun Christianity if we don't give the NSA uh, unlimited surveillance capability? Well, back You're in the tough. day, to be fair, I, I agree with you now. <laughs> back in the day, we weren't worried, you know, 2005, six, seven, we weren't worried that Muslims would show up in our home and convert, convert us, us. To, to Islam. We were worried they would like behead us to, to be fully fair. And and that doesn't that doesn't seem to be the threat that was promised in the early 2000s. The Kurds, <laughs> look, look, the radical Muslims and the Kurds have exactly what we're saying we want in a balkanized state. And that doesn't mean that I affirm the way they choose to live. That's why I choose to live here. Any of us could, could with good reason, you know, take a plane over to, uh, uh, you know, Jordan and then, you know, <laughs> get on a camel and mosey our way into the Kurd, the Kurdish territory. And, and Do camels mosey. Know, yeah, I think they do. I don't know if they mosey, but you know, we could, we could camel our way into the Kurdish territory and, 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 you know, do our best to live a, a goat caveman life. But, you know, that, 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 that's within our power. Um, but Some we, people but, want but we, but we don't want that. We don't, and you know, white Muslim whites that convert to Islam are weird to me, but I'm just saying, um, <laughs> they're lost. I'm being, I'm being funny now, but, but crisis. to go back to what I, to what I'm trying to get at. And I, and I think of it from a spiritual context and I let the Bible guide me both in, in concrete terms, but also in, in, uh, in, in novel ways, right? And so we talk about the end times a lot and we talk about the four, the four horsemen of the apocalypse and I see them as ide ideologies. I, I can see a, a broader motif of the four horsemen as ideologies, right? And, and the progression is, is in sync with a lack of faith. Secularism was first, 
right? Secularism is the death. That's the death horse. It's not death in the physical world. It was a spiritual, metaphysical, philosophical death. Secularism came first. Then you had liberalism. Liberalism, which is war, right? Um, communism came next, which is famine, which is the great famine, right? The, the great hunger, the great hunger for individual rights, the great hunger for sovereignty, but also there's real famines that came down under communism, no doubt. Um, and the final one is conquest, and that's globalism. We have done an ideological progression from secularism to liberalism to communism, and then finally globalism. Those are the four horsemen. And, and it's, it's like uh, we in the conservative movement here in America, let's just cut the shit. Let's just cut the shit. I mean, I'm watching this House speakership thing, and I know I, I don't mean to go political because AJ, AJ gets, uh, doesn't, doesn't like love the political like that. He's like, yeah, this is, this is something else. Um, but, um, and, and you can add to this from a, from a spiritual standpoint, I, but I'm watching the House speakership, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm amped up for the first time. I'm, I'm revved up. I'm saying, hey, we got 20 holdouts here. We actually have some movement. We actually have yeah. some. We actually have a seat, a change in the in the narrative. And but I said the other day or yesterday on Alex Jones's show, I go, but we don't know how many in these 20 holdouts are actually genuine. We don't know how many people in these 20 holdouts are, are actually there for the right reasons. And slowly but surely, they all trickled off after the, you know, as the day went on. I know. Yeah, one I week. Know. They made it like one week. These, but my, my point is. Even. Not, Not even a week. And they and they look all the people and I I said this yesterday and I think it's it's both funny and true. Uh, it's not by accident that most of the people in Washington D.C. wear crooked suits, right? And they they really are crooked suits, both metaphysical, you know, metaphorically and and in reality. Um, we they they are a reflection of us. They're they're a reflection of what we we want. Yeah, they're, and they're a reflection of our our lack of uh, you know virtuous ambition even because yes. people look at a five-day stand and they're like man they really they really wow. put up a strong front right and it's like we talk about this all the time you know when the the founding fathers uh were were writing the documents for the declaration of independence they'd have to travel across country and go stay there for you know six eight weeks couple months oh, three man. months four months and that's why they only did it at summer they could only and, do it at some. Yep. And yeah. not only that, they would go there, stay, and then it would just be them doing that until they got done. They didn't say, okay, well, we're going to hit this point. And if we don't have it at this point, then we can't fund this thing. So then, you know, we just got to deal with whatever we have right there. Right. Like they were like, no, this is indefinite. We're going to go as long as we go. And by the way, by the way, that's why the strong intellects were actually able to win out. If they had put a deadline on it, it would have been a, a that's a good you know, point. A mosh, yeah, a right. mosh Corrupt pit, status quo. a mosh pit yeah. of a bunch of bad ideas, a bunch of people who would, you know, fake actors who'd be like, yeah, you know, I throw this idea out. The real intellects can hang with an idea, night after night, day after day, right? They can have a conversation with you for ten hours straight and hang to the same and come and just beat it down over and over and over and over again. I, I always say to Royce, imagine, imagine if someone had to get into a room and and talk to me until we decided on a conclusion no matter how long it took whether it was you know 2 months 6 months a year man i i'm just i'm just saying like like to me that indefiniteness like that's that's the starting point for actual fruitful ideas that's another uh, that's another war that should be but fought. that's but yep. other people would Agreed. oh man the 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 you know uh the level of things you have to have straightened out emotionally, mentally, to even, you know, monks will talk about this. Catholic monks will talk about this. Monastics will talk about this, that um, you have to have so many. That's why the, the rule of, of St. Benedict arises and the rule of these different monastic orders arises because you have to have certain things super tight in order to even venture into that territory. A contemplative life does not come easy. You know, we in America, we want that as a sort of alternative to one of our vanity vacations is like, well, now I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go pray in India yeah. for four, you know, I'm going to go visit an ashram and do it. But, but everything, everything for them is temporary discipline. Nothing is indefinite, infinite discipline. If it's infinite, indefinite discipline, you have to have a reason structure behind it. And that's harder to come by. If it's temporary, if I just, you know, don't eat, you know, candy for a day. 
That's not hard. I mean, give me a week, a Lenten season, four weeks, six weeks, whatever it is. Like, that's not that hard. But if I have to indefinitely cut it off, now I have to deal with, with pleasure, the nature of pleasure, which isn't just automatically bad. <laughs> like, I have to deal with how am I reconciling this? How do I make sense of this in myself? Like, like most people, when they even just, even in just an area of diet, when they go to have a real diet on something, it starts to deform their whole psyche. It's visibly evident on them. Yeah. They try and stop drinking. It is visibly evident that they're like lost. They don't know, you know, how to talk to someone. They certainly don't have the virtue promptly with ease, with delight, because that virtue, right? And Tim, you know, you know this perfectly well. The virtue is, is the powers directing the acts through the reason, right? And reason being one of the powers, but it's, it's the reason directing the acts. So you have to have an intellectual edifice for why you're not doing, why are you not drinking, right? If it's like, ah, drinking doesn't work well for me. Uh, eh, that's a bad one. That has no intellectual substance whatsoever. If it's, oh, uh, you know, here, a cheat code, I'll give you the answer. If it's intoxicants are psychoactive substances, and that's not the purpose of nourishment, right? That's, that actually supplies an identity a human identity that says uh, my whole being exists for the sake of my brain, because that's what psychoactive substance act on the substrate of the organic brain. And then you realize, Oh, that's an inversion. And actually my, my, my whole life doesn't live for my brain. My brain lives in service of my whole life. Now it can click and you can not only cut out alcohol, you can cut out marijuana, coffee, the list goes on. Most people can't do that. And they can't even see a threat between that. And they're a little bit threatened if someone even draws the thread. That's right. Between coffee and and alcohol and marijuana same, and whatever same, other drugs. Same way that your conspiracy theory re re rejectionists get threatened when you draw a thread between international foreign affairs. Yes. It's the same instinct. It's the same one. So it's they, the exact they just, instinct. they know, but, but that's how you have an actual virtue around sobriety. And it's not one that says uh, the AA version tries to go so extreme, which, yeah, there's some nuggets of truth, but it tries to go so extreme as to say uh, a disease model of alcoholism. You, you, you know, you just it's uh, you have genetics and uh, you can't handle it, but they can. Uh, but they can't. There's no principle in that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That doesn't that won't create a peace inside oneself in how they're living toward the world. And yeah, so, nor, um, nor same thing with people with their phones, by the way, when they're like, um, I can't cultivate temperance in my soul. Therefore, I'm just going to get get rid of a phone. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's not a bad. I, I guess there's the occasion of sin. You know, if your right hand calls you to sin, cut it off. That's the next best thing. But that is a less viable alternative to cultivating yeah, temperance. It's, it's worth it's worth noting. You do always have to start with rigid boundaries. You do have to go too far. The the the, ra the, the rationality does not Orders. go right to the medium, right? You have to literally polarize. So yeah, probably cut your phone out, but uh, you're going to have things that you're going to have to straighten out way more. And then later on, it can actually, it can draw back to the balanced place. If you think, uh, you know, oh, I'm, yeah, you're right. I'm going to manage my alcohol by uh, weaning off of it. Like, eh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're an idiot. You haven't even begun yet. Let's, like, no, let's you, you should with, go fully me... sober for a while. Maybe let, a long let, time. Let me ask you guys a couple questions. Just just one word answers. I just want to identify where each of you are. Um, yeah. <laughs> just one word. Um, okay. So did the CIA kill Kennedy, uh, each of you in turn, because of the threat to the CIA and the FBA, FBI and the NSA? What's the FBA? Uh, Royce, then, then, yeah, then, uh, AJ, I can't answer anything in one word, Tim. What kind of crazy constraint <laughs> is that to put? Well, what, what, kind wanna, of, what kind of weird podcast censorship is this? Well, I want to nail one you word. guys down on because I don't think AJ thinks Benedict retired because of the NSA, and I'm 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 fully yeah, in on yeah. that. So that was coming. Uh, next, let me let me. Uh, I'd say Kennedy. Yes, yes. The CIA, the intelligence community definitely has something to do with it. But it was it was more, I think it was more about the repeal of the Fed. I think the Fed, I think the 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 yeah. the repeal on the Fed was also a huge driving force because the Fed and the the military industrial complex, I mean, they, they, you know, they're coalesced. So it it was the the dy dynamic of the two. But it was 
definitely inner America politics. Uh, so mine would be Kennedy. I, I don't think was killed by a lone gunman. I'll go hard on that. Clear on that. Um, but Duh. yeah, I, I think they, they make it, <laughs> they make it ambiguous enough in, uh, who's, who's pulling the strings. You know, we talked about this the other time where they want to draw you into a declarative statement so that, uh, you, you can kind of end up, you know, gaslighting yourself, sending yourself down a crazy, uh, place fixating on objects, phantom objects. So I, I don't know what apparatus of people came together, whether it's the fed interest, whether it's intelligence agency interests, whether it's uh, an international cabal interest, I guess I, I'm not sure. Okay, um, but it's not alone. But gun. but it's not alone. Gun. So I hope that's blue not, blue. not a lone gun, no you know, blue. random dude who just like ah, magic bullet. I don't know. Maybe has some like uh, erotic, some stifled, crazy. repressed erotic desire for JFK or something. And just I got to kill him. Like, yeah, I don't think that's, so. that. <laughs> that's very imaginative. All right. How about <laughs> yeah. how about Benedict's retirement? Did 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 Benedict retire because. I, I'm starting with you, AJ, on this one. Yeah, ben in Royce. earnest. I, I go, Are yeah, you in, blue in earnest here in, in earnest. He really just thought he thought. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I know that you're supposed yeah, to die. In I, I think I think uh, I think my my gut says Benedict uh, retired in earnest. Yep. Oh, brother. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm having some fun with you now. Royce, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. I think it's prudent for every person who has an allegiance to every institution with a huge historical constraint on powerful positions to assume that untimely resignations or untimely demises are a matter of coalesce, uh, coalesce wickedness and conspiracy. I think that's just prudent. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's not the case, what do you lose by, you know, by, uh, by considering such? I agree. Um, does it I make agree. sense that people in the I, but but see I also but as you guys know I'm also not opposed to considering right as such right I just I was just still thinking you AJ. I yeah no right right no, no I don't I, mind your answer I'm just saying it's, 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 it's just hey it wouldn't shock me if he was pressured or blackmailed or you know forced out um it wouldn't shock me yeah it's I just so I much evidence for, there's so for, much for evidence me for, for me the implications of that on Benedict's faith would be to an extent that not only do I think doesn't resonate with uh, what he sort of attested to throughout his life, but even even the the backdoor, you know, comments of people that hear little nuggets of wisdom from him in his retirement and at the end of his life. To me, I look at that. I, I said it. I wasn't filled with a, a dread when he he passed away, whereas some people and we were actually throwing this around as talking about this ahead of time, but, but where some people, when they die, I, I have a sense of dread because, you know, death is unnatural to the human person. The separation of the body and soul was not supposed to happen. For people who are wondering, in original nature, something like, uh, you know, uh, yeah. an assumption into heaven is what would have come at the end of one's time. It's not that they wouldn't have had the, the, the arc of a life cycle that, uh, uh, you know, a material creature has. It's that the, the soul was, was, the immaterial soul was so rightly in its place that it would have drawn the material up into it. And so the separation of it is, is unnatural and it's uncomfortable and it's, it's scary and it ought to be. And um, so for most people, for a lot of people, when they die, um, I, I feel some intermix of sort of dread worry for that case um, with, with a Pope Benedict. Um, I, I, I don't feel it. And I'm not saying that that's, you know, 100% proof. But I will say this, um, you know, grace when acting in someone is acting in them. Um, and, and we could do a longer conversation on that. But, you know, as uh, Aquinas distinguishes it, there's operating and cooperating grace. Um, and that cooperating grace isn't like possible grace. Uh, it's not sufficient grace. It's not sufficient grace. Um, it's cooperating grace is grace that God is, is working through one that their free will is also going to come along with it, but it's still happening. And, um, predestination too, again, not about the individual, um, but Aquinas and Augustine have predestination, right? And so the, the person who's being moved toward God, right? Why do we have some, uh, as, as Aquinas uses the, the imagery, why do we have some, some, um, furniture uh set aside for the 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 nice the nice rooms in the house and some for the toilet or you know for the bathroom for uh you know uh, more dishonorable things well um actually your house is going to be a better house if you have that range of things than if you just have only dining rooms in your house right it, it's actually toilets. better for you. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or I mean, if you only have toilets, bad house too. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but you need you want the blend of it, and so all of God's creation is to communicate the goodness of Him. That's you know the ultimate end is 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 uh, His glory, um, which is the communication of His goodness. That's what His glory is, um, and uh, and and so there are people set aside. I I do happen to be be of the sense that I no I, I think I think Benedict I think. Grace pierced through in that individual. Uh, praise be to God, and um, and that uh, many riches come from his, from from him, from that that penetration, from that mm -hmm. uh, uh, level of sort of um, union uh, with with God, and and I think that um, it imbued all all the actions along the way, um, um, because grace. Well, and then especially when we're talking sanctifying grace, where it creates a quality in one's soul um that that's only lost through mortal sin and and i think i, I do think that the suggestion uh, by the way by the way if he punted on the pontificate um because of some sort of of threat you know dante does this well uh even the the nuns who are in very early in paradise very early on in paradise the nuns that fled because of uh violence um there, there's a that's why they're lower in it because even though they gave it up of violence it was their will uh, co-signing that violence to get out of it. And so they're in a very low place. Uh, it's probably a, a, a nice uh, olive branch that he kept them in heaven. Because the reality is, is that um, to to punt on it by these things we're talking about would would clearly, clearly qualify a mortal sin. Um, whether, uh, and, and again, weakness doesn't diminish the genus of a mortal sin. It It only diminishes the temporal punishments, the sort of temporal effects that come along with mortal sin, which can be different, right? A moral sin can have more or less temporal punishments, but it, it's a, it, it would be a moral sin for him to uh, to punt on the faith like that in that in that direct way, especially in that role. And so well, I, um, I don't I, I don't know that I, I think it didn't I think but, it didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. No. So I, I just yeah, you're saying I, I, I don't think he could have because because a lot of Catholics have Benedict as a some sort of post conciliar saint. Most of the post conciliar popes are have been made saints, but I don't. And then, then they reason backwards. Oh, he couldn't have done that. I, I don't understand this the the evidence is there and therefore i believe you know he quit he was scared about a certain group forcing him out it turns out there are a couple groups that that seem to have forced him out the evidence is strongly there everyone was saying he's going to quit we're going to force him out this is whispering all throughout the pontificate and um he was a liberal he was a liberal when he was young right he supported the casper plan for uh communion for the uh divorced and remarried he was a ronerite uh, he he said, I switched yeah. positions. He never really apologized. And he, you should listen to this Marco Tassati interview I, I listened to on LifeSite News where he's like, look, he wasn't a liberal when he was older. He was a conservative, but but he wasn't a fighting man. And that's, what, that's his way of saying, you know, there's an Aristotelian way of saying, I don't want to say it the Aristotelian way, but he wasn't a fighting man. He wasn't like JP2 from the streets of Krakow fighting the communists. And I'm not really a JP2 fan, but but Benedict just he was he was not a fighter. He was a he's a professor and oh, he gave I, I agree. what he's, they wanted. He's a meek, he was a meek man. There's part of the reason why I just think he didn't want to be in the papacy. That's actually why it lines up for me that he didn't want to be in the papacy. He definitely um, didn't I, want to like be. Like I said, that. I think I think in, in earnest, I don't think that that's a, a false modesty. I think that was in earnest that he didn't want to be in the papacy. Um no, and, I, I agree there. That you know, yeah, no, I, I think, uh, again, but to be clear, whether it's one group or four groups or it's cowardice, um, that's still with, with the, the, the genus of the matter at hand, uh, would be a mortal sin, which of course you'd have to account for. And, and let's also be clear on the satisfaction for that. Um, he would have to repent publicly because it's a public office, uh, and it had public implications. So for him, uh, to be good to go. That repentance can't be. Uh, you, you can't have the public offense and then uh, apologize privately and and merit the the parameters of satisfaction. That's very um, true. That's, even in a I basic agree. way, yeah, yeah. So so I, I think there were those terms. Yeah, yeah, right. So look so who he I left think, us with, and also look how many times he said there is no daylight between my theology and Francis's. After Francis, this abusive stepfather was was beating us up. He had, he had no remorse. He had no remorse. See, I, th I think, you know, experience. and I've, I've heard him reference it, but I think he, you know, he understands that, you know, the disciples scared of Jesus being asleep in the boat, like the Lord, 
the Lord's got it. <laughs> and uh, I, I've said it before. I, I think that the, the modernist agenda, that is them directing all things toward their end, which is that modernist agenda, that globalist agenda. And it's coming from multiple areas. Um, but I think, you know, that's it. To me, that's an easy, easy calculation to make that, oh, yeah, this is a contradiction. And by the way, um, this circles back to what Royce was saying earlier about laying out the 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 global field of who the targets are, who the sort of, you know, enemies are. Um, most things are low resolution for most people, even in our own selves. Our emotions take time to crystallize. And um, part of <laughs> part of God's defeating an enemy is not to go, you know, snuff out uh, baby Hitler in, in the crib. No, it, it lets these things uh, clarify and crystallize so that the defeat is actually far more clear, right? And so I actually think that uh, the, the communist, the, the, the error that is the communist I, I, uh, idea, and, and the error is, is on the level of charity, right? It's not just an error of like, oh, you know, kind of a good, you know, economic idea. Like, no, it, it, is, it is rotten at a much more fundamental level. Yeah. But I think that this communist idea, um, you know, has to play out probably for a few hundred years still to come for uh, sort of the human sense around it, the sort of average sense around it to sort of see the rottenness in it. Because most people do not see things uh, in the core. They see it in their in their effects and their latter effects at that. Um, so so something profound. right something that needs to go on for these things to play out in such a way that when God crushes them, he brings us along with the crushing of it. He brings our free wills along with not it. Not doing it for and, you. Yeah, it's not, it's not, he's not just sitting there, he's not sitting there going, Hey, I'm just gonna stamp out this modernist identity right here in 1972. Cause guess where we'd be at at uh 2023 right now? But do you believe uh, that? But but people it would be nuts, they the would have other the, things at the same time. And this question goes yeah. both of you. Do you believe that in the free in, in in your free will that you can hasten that crystallizing? Well, I if you if you're actually going direct, I think that certain people possessing of a stronger intellect certainly do crystallize things quicker. And so for them, it, you know, emotions are a sort and of those people lead other people to uh, emotions. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 they're meant to, and they're meant to. So so I'm not saying that's this so that, that what I'm saying, and well, this is the yeah, difference. What I'm saying is that's why I brought the David reference. Yeah, yeah, that's what David did for the people in absolutely. that story. Absolutely, he crystallized that. Whoa, hold on, hold on. <laughs> you guys got this confused. You think that these giants are, are he, can't be slain? He goes, he goes caught up in the physical world. But I'm telling you that God got it. He, God, yeah, God. he goes. He goes. You think these uncircumcised Philistines? You think this is the enemy? Are, yeah, the, the uncircumcised. He's right, like three times. Back. I'm gonna bring you his head. Yeah, that's what I. That's why when I said here, war, yeah. Tim, I mean, I, I mean, there may be a physical war, but I mean, like the war is is ideological. It's it's it's, you know, it's philosophical. Well, and it's and it's all interconnected, right? We are hylomorphic beings, so the the ideological and the physical are are not. Yeah. Separated. Yes, there's there, we can we can uh, make a logical distinction focusing on one versus the other, but there's a, a sort of unity there and they and they will right. come about that way. So so I say all this not to temper uh, your guys conversations of things to bring these out, because even that works toward the crystallization, the people who 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 see it earlier in the roots. It's for them to help crystallize, to bring more along, because that also is a part of God's plan. So that the the knowledge of that of the wrong of that thing penetrates that much deeper. And there's a track record of it all along the way across the centuries, along with a communism, along with a modernism. Um, and so, so I look at it and I go, yeah, yeah, this, this is coming about. I think, I think Benedict's sitting there going, Jesus is, 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 is absolutely in control. He is not asleep in the boat, uh, in the way you guys think of it, you know, in the way, in the way we see it, not you, but like the apostles in the boat, the way, the way they're looking at it. Um, and, and what is happening, right? What ends up coming out of that? is that when he rebukes the winds, when he rebukes nature and it stops, right? What comes about of that is they're like, well, this dude's way different than we thought. We thought he was good, but whoa. And of course, for most of them, it's not even going to click until the resurrection. Well, then they're, what, what is going on? <laughs> like, and, then, and then in his resurrected body, spends 40 days with them. Like, no, I'll answer all your questions. <laughs> like, it's not like he resurrected for a second lived on in their hearts, right? It, it took that crystallizing process from, it's not, he wasn't figuring out his divinity. 
as the the heretics say, he wasn't figuring it out, but God was drawing it out yeah, of right. the people around it. Mm-hmm. And so, so to me, I like, it just seems it, 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 to me, I, it, it, it maybe comes clear where I'm not expecting it to be clear uh, just across the board because it's not that it's that crystallized yet at all. But I think, I think in Benedict, there's a sense of like, yeah, not only is uh, uh, Francis now the Pope, but I can even support him and the papacy because none of this falls outside of the purview and the divine institution, which is the Catholic Church, is vouchsafed by the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's vouchsafed frankly, in the, in the, frankly, the something's going on. Will, I'll say this. I'll say this. Well, of God. Yeah. But, but I'll say this too. But I'll say this too that something's going on with the liturgy that uh, is, is, I do think, working in the same thread. Right. Um, there is something going on, which is working to perfect it, even if we're taking a, a backwards route or a seemingly backwards route or an actual back, backwards route. Right. There is something going on. I, I mean, I'll say it. Uh, you know, I know, Tim, and I'm, I'm going to poke at you here, but the the uh, the people who, who talk about the Reverend Novus Ordo, Novus Ordo Mass, um, I've been to great TLMs. We have some great ones here in the Twin Cities. Um, and uh, if I'm on my own, you know, on a Sunday, family's out of town or something, and I'm going to mass, like, dude, I'm, I'm going to the Cathedral St. Paul. Have y'all ever seen that building? It's amazing. And that mass is going to be in English, but I love how they do the, 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 the Sanctus and the Gloria. They do, they do versions of it where I'm like, yeah, I like this. Now, yeah, nothing comes close to the, the Latin, the, the Gregorian uh, Gloria. The glory I in excelsis Deo. I mean, that is fire, right? And I love when they mix it in. But um, uh, and, and I love like the ad orientum. I I want to see mix of those because it, it does it draws out more reverence for me. But um, I'm also like, yeah, dude, I don't I don't know Latin fluently. If I see it on a page, there's individual words I can kind of pick out. But if someone's saying it, and I, it's not that I need to hear. It. I'm, I half the time, I mean, I'm probably you know my mind's going elsewhere anyways. But um. But I think there's something testifying to the fact that, yeah, if I have my own time, and, and by the way, it's equal distance to a TLM or to the Cathedral St. Paul, I'm going to the cathedral. I mean, that building, the beauty of it, and all those things, and the times, like I said, because they'll have times uh, through the liturgical season where they mix Latin in, and uh, once or twice over the last couple of years, they've even had a Latin mass in honor of some specific circumstance, and it's been awesome going to it. It's fun, but it's a fun experience. I do feel like I'm LARPing when I'm doing it. Like, I don't know how else to get outside of that because I don't know Good, Latin like Good. that. Right. Maybe you but, don't need to know Latin, but right. here's, no, here's and the I, I hear you. No, I hear you. And I've listened here's to all of it. I, I'm just telling you, I'm telling you that um, it's not just, oh, well, it's a reverent Norvis Odo. I'm telling you that I have, I have more of a connection in those. I'm, I'm telling I'm giving you, and by the way, I, I don't think, uh, my, my faithfulness of my Catholicism, my hardlining of my Catholicism, go read, you know, read advanced Christianity. It's not in question where I am on the one God, on the, on the Trinity, on the blessed Trinity, on the hypostatic union, on predestination, on sin, on justice, on, right. On grace, right. It's not, I feel like I am down the middle on it and, and not, 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 you know, not, um, you know, straddling a middle, a middle ground. I mean, I'm thinking square oh, on the lines of, of what it is. And, 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 and this, you know, I've been, I've been thinking about lately. It's like, dude, what, what does my heart tell me that when I have the time to choose to go to one, um, I way more often go to, to, to an English speaking one. I don't, like what, do, I don't know. You tell me what to make of it. it, it, it is it that I'm, is it that I'm corny? Go ahead. Like, Say, maybe, I don't know. I've never been. Maybe. I'm in the hey, life. hey, I'll say I've this. Been I'll say this. Two reverend maybe. Novus Ordos in my entire life. And yeah, but, I, they, but every time they weren't that here, reverent. So yeah, but but every know. time, but every time I go down south, I I see the same thing. I'm in I'm in a, a rec center, doing it. And yeah, you're right. No, it makes me feel rotten when I'm sitting in it. And even if they were to spice up the way of the mat, like it's just off. You know, I I'm saying there. I maybe it's a Twin Cities thing, but we have some beautiful churches up here. In the Twin Cities, and a lot of people, obviously outside of this area, wouldn't know this, but um, um, Archbishop John Ireland in the late 1800s set up a bunch of these schools, and he made sure that there was no Jesuit influence in the Twin Cities. So a lot of people don't know this, but our Catholic universities, none of them are Jesuit. 
None of them are Jesuit. Now they've merged to try and do a sort of symbiosis with the modernist thing. Definitely hands down, but all of them in their origins, they weren't. The so we don't, of- we don't, we don't have Jesuit high schools. We don't have Jesuit universities. Um, it's not here in the twin cities. And there's something I'm, I'm not saying one church. I'm saying you go around the block, you go to cathedral, St. Paul, you go to Basilica, St. Mary's, you go to uh, St. Mark's, you go to St. Agnes, you go to uh, St. Helena's, you go to nativity, you go to uh, what used to be called St. Luke's. All these buildings are epic hitters. They're all hitters. (laughs) And so I'm, I'm just saying that uh, there's something going on where it's like, it's, it's just, it's just sort of matter of fact to me. And I will say this, I will say this. If it's a question of whether I'm the corny one or they're the corny one, I don't know. I don't know. I, if I were a betting man, which I'm not, I'd probably place my, my money one way versus another. <laughs> that's just, that's just how my, my instinct would be. Someone would have to prove it to me otherwise. Is it, is, but I'll tell is you it, what. Is it guys, bet a sin? Let me, I don't I'll know. tell you what. I'll tell you what. Yeah. Right. I'll yeah. tell you what. Most of these other guys, are, gotta get a ruling. they're not, they're not, they're not making me go, Oh man, uh, you know, I'm shaking, you know, Oh man. Uh, you know, Hey, respect to all these, but like, you know, Taylor Marshall is making me go, Oh man, like <laughs> that guy's probably the real one. Like, or, you know, whoever else down the list, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry to call him out by name like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause I, I even like a lot of the stuff he does, but I'm like, dude, I'm sorry. You guys aren't winning me over <laughs> at all. It's not even close. Like I can say it with comment. It's not even close. Uh, so I don't know. And, and then when there's some, you know, traditional priest who I maybe really like, and, and then uh, you see them at a, a, a lecture and they're like five foot four. I'm like, sorry, dude. Like not winning me over. I, like, we can talk about this or I see I, you find out some, some commentator, they come out in the open and the dude's like five, seven. And I'm like, I mean, not saying that that disqualifies things, but if your whole aura doesn't at least incorporate the reality of that, it's dishonest. something's off. Yeah. Like if you were, if you were a division three athlete, something's off. I don't even know why you play a sport. If you're I, like, I can't even process it. I can't this even make, I, I can't make sense. Yeah. Of it. So, yeah, this is, I, so I'm, I'm glad I'm people. six one at least, bro. All right. Yeah. Oh, no, but I'm, I'm like, I'm we like, gotta just let this dude go off. I think this is gold. Uh, we were supposed to end, but yeah. just keep going. I'm loving this. Yeah. I'm he's like, saying. look, if you're five, four, then you're dead to me. Wait, 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 wait. Let's hone in on this. Wait, wait, stop, 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 stop. Wait, stop. I See, this, this is how Royce and I always talk. This I is why to, it's funny. My to, guys, my guys who know me, they know this is this is how I need you to hone in on this, Tim. I, I gotta just let's <laughs> let's doubt, let's just rewind to one part. Back it up. I was watching the interview movie with uh yeah. James Franklin. Hold on. Did you just say you're wait, did you just say you're gay? Hold on, let's just <laughs> hold on. Back it up. Hold on, back it up. Like gay is did it? you just no. say that there is something gravely wrong? With the with the with the psychol with the psychology of the D three athlete writ large, <laughs> yes, yes, for yes. being a D three athlete, I, nothing. I can't make that sense of crazy it. Crazy funny. I can't, I literally can't make sense of but it. But why? Explain it to me. I cannot because I feel you on a spiritual level. Oh, if, if it had look, if I had not been, if <laughs> blessed to be six eight, with, no, 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 uh, I mean, look, incredible. If I had not been the number one player in the state, okay. And if I had not been in that top 15 or 20 that end up being at D1, D1 colleges, and if I had dropped a D2, might have still went. If I had dropped to D3 basketball, I would have never played basketball again. Dude. And that's not a testament of me saying, hey, I, you know, if it's D3, then I'm, I can't work my way up. Because Devin George actually went yeah, D3 yeah. out of Augsburg and then made it to the NBA. It's just that. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Devin George went to, to play with the Lakers. He went to Augsburg here in Minnesota as yep. D3 college. He's from yeah. Benilde St. Mark. But he also was 6'3", and then he ended up being 6'9". So that was unique. Yeah. But but I can honestly say that my identity was not so tied up in sports oh. that I would have even considered, uh, uh, you know, playing D3. I mean, D3. Just tell me exhibit. what you mean. Tell yeah, me what yeah. you mean by D3. What yeah. do you mean? What's- no, ex- exhibit A. I mean. You know me, I have a, a visceral reaction against fake competitiveness. Yeah. It, D3 sports are the most fakely competitive institution. If you've carved yourself out and put a name on it, why don't you guys just not even label your division? Like, just don't even label. You literally labeled it D3? 
I don't even like I can't even process how anyone goes and signs up and goes, yep, I'm doing that. Dude, there's got to be some place sports. for for six one like guards. Yeah, th there is intramural sports like pickup at the park. No, we got to push back on this. Listen. Go ahead, Come please. On, I'm probably in the wrong. Damn, hold on, man. I'm in the wrong, but you I can't, I can't like grasp it. I like the spirit of it because, you know, I mean, you're just a, you're just a, you got you got some fight in you. I like this. This is good. But all I'm saying is we can't make sense of it. All I'm saying is I think the impetus of a lot of well, here's the here's the real issue. But can I can I do this, Tim? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Let's let's make this the parting shot. I, I want to okay. hear it, though. OK. Yeah. Here's the real here's the real issue is that the commercialization of of college sports has created what you and I agree is an anti-competitive stronghold on Division I level and has stopped the proliferation of uh, uh, a, a division list playing field, right? And I think that... Yeah, yeah. I mean, there should be leagues. There should be higher... Yeah. And, and Division One. by yeah. the way, Division One. by the way, Division One. I mean, Division um, Three is more of a, no. a result of a, corporatocra a, a corporatized Division One because here, here's... And this is the no, truth. No, I, I don't necessarily... Because there I, are D3 players and D2 players who could play D1, but there just weren't enough scholarships. Yeah. And, and yeah, I they should have, but they should have not played. Right. No, that's a different, I understand what you're saying. They should have just been like, cause like you said, they should have been like, well, I don't need to play them. Yeah. If I don't need to play. It is. This they is what they like, come to grips with that. Yeah. But what I'm saying is all things fair. I don't know what you're doing with your time on like to go to practice. And why would you go to practice? Yeah, that's true. That is true. It's all, it, Dude, it still eats up your whole schedule and you're, yeah. Why would you they, they treat it like a D1 with a D3. That. I think a lot yeah. of guys do it. For, I think a lot of guys do it because they, they, they're like, okay, I'm going to split the, I'm going to split the difference. But have you, have I'm going to get an education. Never... The real scam, the real scam in it isn't the D3 sports. The real scam in it is the D3 education. You've well, some, <laughs> but that's a scam. <laughs> but you've never, but hold on, hold on. You maybe never met that many D3 players. Plus there's a great actually great school. It's like, is it really? Yeah, actually a break. Yeah, actually. Uh, <laughs> hold on. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> The University of Minnesota isn't a great school. It's 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 a globalist woke state. watering hole. It's a watering it's, hole. Yeah, so I'm definitely not. McAllister is some bastion of higher learning. Yeah, and therefore, you know, it's like I I get why the D three jerk offs need to jerk off. They're going to McAllister. Yeah, they got to sit in a McAllister, you know, so, social studies class. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I need this is to like a, a Minneapolis uh, Denison only uh, conversation. I feel left out because I don't know. If McCallum. you're from Minnesota, you'll get it. But it's like you'd probably know. be very offended. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. You. Look, I'm if sorry. You, if you got a college education, look, I was on. I got to say this too, Tim, we're just dragging you into the deep waters. I know your eyes are getting heavy. Listen, <laughs> I was on Christian Walker's. Uh, uh, he had a Twitter space the day after the midterms about Herschel Walker. And, uh, you know, I had commented on there and. And some people were sending it to me because I had commented on Herschel's uh, candidacy and the whole thing. And the midterms, obviously, I was involved. But um, so I hopped on his live. And Herschel Walker goes, I mean, not Herschel Walker, but uh, Christian Walker. He's talking about how the new rhino is anybody who won't bow to Mar-a-Lago. The new rhino is this and DeSantis is the guy and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, he's got that, he's got that homo thing going on, that homosexual, you know, uh, you know, vindictive personality, weird thing happening. And, uh, you know, the way he talks, right. And it's just, yeah. you know, ad hominem or not. And when you talk like that, I don't, I don't really take you serious, but so I hopped on there and I say, I say, who do you people think DeSantis is? This guy went to Yale. Yeah. Uh, he went to Yale. And then Christian Walker goes, he goes, well, are, if you're going to be one of those conspiracy theorists or grifters who tries to, who tries to say that, no, uh, it's just that, the that, that we don't want anybody who was educated to be, uh, you know, in the Republican Party, I'm just not going to listen to that. Then he kicked me out of the, the Twitter space. Yeah. But um, oh, wow. so I'm not saying anything about people who were educated in college. I'm not going to say anything about people who play D3 sports, although that's hilarious. And I think there's some, some real juice in, in what AJ said um, about, about self-identity and self-worth. Cause that is a lot of time that you could be spending on much more fruitful things. Um, but, but you should still exercise. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't opt for you oh, to not yeah. be a D3 athlete and then become a fat, uh, you know, office 
you know, potato either. Uh, so, so there, there's a, there's a, there's a balance in there, but what, what is true is that these college, you, you, you want to say, you asked me where the war is, the academic institutions, war ground. Number one. I just wrote, don't go to college, bro. That's the I mean, first that's, war. That, hold on. That, that, that Let is me, hold the on. first war ground is the institution What the Marxists realized what the Marxists realized and what they were brilliant at doing is we can phase out entire swaths of metaphysical, philosophical, and spiritual understanding, tangible understanding, if we target the place that is considered higher learning. And they did it, and they've been great at it, they've been effective at it, and, and we will not turn this nation around or any other nation in one of two ways. Either we need to have that war in, the, in, the academia, in, in academia, or we need to circumvent it and take back the lower education. Uh, but one of them is going to have to, one of those shoes is going to have to drop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind with a, a school like oh, Yale. Oh, yeah, we got a book here. Yeah. <laughs> don't go, don't don't go, go to, college. to college. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah but this, the, this the first thing that comes book. to mind with a school. I hold on. who went to Yale. Yeah, hold on. Hold on. Let's, let's really hone in the resolution on Yale real quick. Um, not even just Ivy Leagues, but the phonetics of the word Yale are off. It just sound it sounds like Yale that corny. Just <laughs> the sound is wrong. Yale, I went to yeah, Yale. The thing is, the Yale guys think they're so they think they're so but cool. It's just it's like just the Yale guys have their own office. Like I'm a Yale guy. At you least know? like Harvard has some substance to it, like phonetically. You know, like there's yeah. a substance to it. Yale sounds off. When you talk about you, look, let's, kind of, let's not dance around. Let's not dance around the conspiracy here. Skull and bones. You can't dance around it. If you go, I, 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 I challenge anybody to go and look up. It's another. This is another three click deal. You know, the concern we act like, oh, it's so hard to figure out what's going on. Three click deal. Skull and bones. Go look at who has been involved over the years and the positions they sit in. And yeah, the Bushes, right? We know the Bushes, sine qua non of the modern, you know, globalist movement. Uh, but modern uh, Yale movement. The, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no doubt, you know. And so, I mean, you know, I don't trust a guy that went to Yale. But I'm going to be honest with you, I don't trust a guy that went to Harvard. Right. Instinctually, especially so, nowadays. Especially so if nowadays. I don't trust a guy who went to Harvard or Yale. Why would I trust a D three school that's trying to imitate Harvard or Yale on a local level? Yeah, I agree. I'm just. Not, I, and, and it's not that I can't come to trust you. It's that your trust is going to have to is going to come with real tangible action and, that I can and, see. And a trust that would come with a humility, with a, an increase in humility. Right. Which is to say um, something along the lines of like, uh, yeah, you're a sports team here, um, but I don't know much else of a label to put on that. Here's a scam. I don't know. Maybe they, it, maybe they should play like multiple sports. Like the, the to, honestly, maybe like the D three teams should be like you know like decathletes of team sports. Like uh, we're we're twenty group. We're a group of twenty guys, and we play we play soccer in the fall and basketball in the winter and uh, cricket in the spring. I don't like do something that like no do something that makes it like resonant they, with they, what they, you're they, trying they, to do. Man. Yeah, something please to make it real. To make it resonant. Okay, it's not okay, making it wait. it's not that it's unreal. We Obviously it's guys. real. They're doing what they're doing, but it's like look, it's not resonant. Look, There's something look, off. Look, we, know, come, we know two guys from Minnesota. I'm not going to let you rail these D3 guys anymore. This is fair. It is what it is. I'm just Calling it like I see it. I'm what's not. The, what's the religious? What's the religious equivalent of D three sports? Protestantism. <laughs> duh. Come on. Like, duh. Let's do that. See, I I tipped that. I I, I tipped that one off. I shouldn't have done that. But listen, we know. I don't agree with that. But listen. <laughs> oh, about the Protestantism or the equivalency or the analogy. <laughs> I it, squares. it all squares. That was, like, that was genuine divisiveness. Okay, yeah. listen. No, it's like we, white Buddhism. A white who practices <laughs> Buddhism is should Judeo Buddhism would answer. probably be the equivalent to me. Protestantism is a little like you know hot, mid major D oh, two. But honestly, but honestly, it's actually the analogy is probably more full with Protestantism because it's like you know Protestant. Yeah, they have like some churches. There's somewhat of like a sort of institutional footprint. Yeah. Like it's honestly actually a pretty good analogy. Judeo Buddhism is probably like uh, I don't those those. 
NAIAC schools that aren't even like JUCO and they're not like I whatever those are. You know what I mean? Like that's probably probably closer. You're to right. It, but right. it's like you're right. And, and ortho, by the way, Orthodox is D2. This analogy holds. Orthodox is D2. It's like the people, they can get a scholarship. So there's kind of something going on, but at the same time, there's, there's even more of a time commitment. It's like, what are you really doing? I don't know what you're really like, like doing. I don't right now. But you need and to so, carve so, out yeah, an so exception for, for like that. For D3 like they got the athletes. sacraments. And- Yo, you need to carve out an exception for <laughs> D3 athletes, basketball, football, which are the two hardest sports to play in college. And like those D3 are the ones I give the least exception volleyball. to. I'd rather hold on. I'd rather carve it out for like cross country, <laughs> lacrosse, like D3, D3 yeah, like three cross country or lacrosse. What does that Dude, say? That means you might never. It means you're just like kind of like running. It means like you're kind of like running and you're like, years. it's like the exercise thing. No, actually, no, I mean, football, basketball are the least, are the worst of them all. They're the most falsely competitive. That doesn't to me follow like if you're a soccer. Hey, hold on, if you're that a soccer follow. player, if you're a soccer player, like D one, you could be like, eh, you know, like I'm good. Like you could be the real deal at soccer and be like, man, eh, you know, I I just don't want to play them. I'm gonna go D three. Like it'll, See, that's it'll a blast sort of resonate there's, with my whole college experience. That makes sense. There's right. there's no such thing as the real deal soccer player, AJ. So you're. Yeah, you're no longer red pilled if you're saying that. You were sounding kind of based when you're saying your D3 thing, but then wait, wait, you don't think I mean, a real deal soccer player? Yeah, Tim, no, soccer, Tim, the Marxist you're... sham? No, no, Tim, Tim, <laughs> Tim, no. wait, why Tim, you Tim, wait, Tim, wait, hold, no. on, hold on, hold on, soccer? hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, soccer. You hold on, hold on. You have to have a very, very deep absence of bodily kinesthetic awareness to write off like all soccer players. Some of those dudes are, are, are freaks. The sport of soccer. They're like five, seven. Please, I gotta hear so we're, we're slipping into your five, six, yeah. five, seven, the greatest soccer players like five, seven. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, for they're, sure. They're good with their feet. I, I, I call it hand eye coordination. Yeah. That's my point. And there's an excellence. There's an excellence there. There's an excellence there, but like save it for the third world countries and, and second graders. I'll give it to them. Yeah, like Europe. Second no, are good hey, there's a reason. There's hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's be clear. Let's be clear. There's a reason <laughs> that soccer is not predominant in America and it's not some cultural thing. It's because the competitive dynamics of football and basketball in particular are much better. Superseded. They're yeah. much better. Of, They're uh, of the discrete motion game of football is far more competitively focused. I mean that objectively. And basketball. And is basketball highest. is the highest form of the continuous, the continuous form of of uh, sport movement. And so there's a reason why it gravi- There's a reason why the glory gravitates toward that. And in a landscape where all those are in play, soccer is nothing. Um, and so, frankly, someone pursuing soccer in general in America is uh, equivalent to the D3 athlete relative to what we were saying. They're not even taking themselves serious yet. Um, I was a great soccer player. I was really good at soccer. I don't know how far I could have gone, but don't I didn't care to find that, out. But don't I didn't care to that. find out, you know, and, um, Tim, and wait, wait, so Tim. it's the same. But it, it, but it's yeah, I mean, the, Tim, the excellence. Wait, 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 Tim. Yeah. What, what, what do you mean that, that soccer is the Marxist scam? I got to hear this. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so you've read Harrison Bergeron, right? The, the short story about like what the Marxists do. They say you can't use if you're if you're good looking, you have to cover your face with a bag. If you're if you have good hand eye coordination, you have to like break one of your hands. If you have any kind of advantage, mm-hmm. you have to get rid of it. Mm-hmm. Like that's soccer. Like I want to use my oh. hands. Bro. I want to use well, okay, but hold on. But this, this is also why. Hold on, hold on, Tim. Tim, I know. Hey, I know. Where you're I know basketball is your game. game. Hold on, hold on. I know basketball is your game. Royce, my guy. Um, but basketball is for abnormally tall people. They could do something to make the competitive constraints of basketball more equivalent. Something along the lines of like, if the if the hoop and it, by the way, it would diminish the excellence of the game. But if the hoop were like 15 feet tall, it would neutralize the the clear height. When Giannis, when Giannis Antetokounmpo dunks a ball by going up on his tiptoes by doing a calf raise. Uh, that's not the same like uh, uh, demand of excellence needed well, as, sure. as any number of other people. And so that's not so an argument are, against basketball though. That's no, it is. Argument. It is. It's the same it's argument, uh, but, it's, but it's say, much, actually it's, much, it's equivalent it's, to the yeah. soccer, the soccer, I don't think it which is. says, which says it, it narrows you to your feet. You can be short. It, there I'd is say, the I'd same the, movement the level, in basketball. The level of expertise and skill. I see my favorite game to play. I'm, I'm going to be, this is what makes it funny to me because <laughs> I will have a, a guilty a guilty confession here. My favorite game to play 
on the video game is FIFA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, oh. really. Sin. That's a mortal sin, Royce. You're you're an NBA <laughs> no, sin- basketball play. You should FIFA's fun. No, FIFA's fun. No, no serious. Well, I spoil. Well, look, everyone, everyone knows. In the that. first look, part of my life, growing up, I played. No, and I mean, in the first part of my life, I played so much NBA Jam, NBA Live, right. NBA 2K that when I was introduced to FIFA, a game, a game that I had tampered with when I was young, but it was like I kind of had the instinct too, like this ain't really, this FIFA's ain't really fun. hard enough. But when I when I got to a place where I could appreciate the level of skill from from soccer, and Kobe was a huge soccer fan too. Um, yeah, which speaks and, volumes. And, Kobe, and I, could, I could play it. Yeah, I, I never forgave it. him. <laughs> but but no, I, I would say Kobe's in, the man. My opinion, by the way, Saint Kobe, pray for us. Yeah, Giannis. Giannis is a freak. Uh, is a freak of is a freak physically. He's an yeah. evolution of human athlete. Okay, and there's something there's something very um, uh, inspirational, divine, and and just extra world about the evolution of athlete in the basketball world, uh, in the basketball context. But I have to say that the level of skill needed to do some of the things, to score some of the goals, to clear some of the levels that a Messi or Ronaldo, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo do, is much, much more difficult than Giannis taking the ball the foot 94 feet and dunking it. It's it's much, much more difficult. I mean, like in the realm of pet, I'm, I'm assuming they're soccer players. So in the realm of pedidexterity, which is a, a fundamentally disordered yep. skill to be that good with your but, feet. But like, it's disordered I'll, I'll to be seven that. foot one. It's disordered to be seven foot one. But I'm just, okay, look at, take, take, take do, do, boy, do any Kyrie. of it, hold on. Do any of their the dimensions fit the Vitruvian Kyrie man? Are, are absolutely, these are, this means when we make this argument against the sports ballers, these are the people in the dissident right that make fun of anyone that likes sports, uh, trad Catholics that well, make fun of anybody. They're just that not hylomorphics. I have, they're not. Then. And I make that, <laughs> well, but except you can't be a hylomorphicist and really believe in pedidexterity. I make the argument. Training, unless we're talking about, you know, pedidexterity for for different sorts of of primates Dude, or something. Is your but, footwork is your footwork really suspect? Because I'll mine? tell you what, when I see an athlete with bad footwork, something's off. We gotta I'm get him on soccer, the court. Bro. I'm, I'm, now I'm starting to get a little skeptical of your footwork like, too. Do you I'm talking think? about Reynaldi or whatever. I don't know the soccer player. Ronaldo. Name, but when you're Cristiano saying that Ronaldo? He's more skilled than Kyrie Irving, then all of a sudden, no, not than Kyrie Irving. No, no. yeah, Kyrie. Kyrie Irving's... Kyrie's six. Kyrie's six feet tall. Well, Kyrie's six feet tall, and he's, he's doing. Kyrie he's is the but... the excellence of. Well, I know that's what I'm Watch saying. Watch it. Watch, except- yeah, absolutely. Oh, don't get me wrong. There are people in basketball that hit a super high threshold, but as a as a conglomerate, the majority of them are are there uh, due to the abnormality of their size no and doubt. their dimensions. No. Think of them. It was that, their skill players, now. seven, eight million dollars a year. And this is why the superstars that that are superstars often stand out. But even amongst the yeah. superstars, we fail often to make the distinction about, between the skillful superstar and the the superstar like Shaquille O'Neal. Right is is and and we kind of we don't really put them on the same playing field, but we kind of do in our in our sports world. But it's like there's a significant difference between LeBron and Giannis, right? And and you can t- and Le- LeBron's a sellout. Don't get me wrong, uh, he he's working for the CCP. But when it comes to his skill on the court, the the keystone, the 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 the, the essential key attribute and skill that you have to acknowledge with LeBron is his anticipation his anticipation and his hand-eye coordination to be able to pass the ball on time, on target, ahead of five other defenders' awareness. That is a very, very high-level skill. But what? guess what that skill is likened to? Had a dexterity. Soccer. It is. <laughs> no, the, no, seriously. The art of – no, I'm telling you, the art, yes. the art of passing – and the art of anticipation when you kick, and this is why I love the soccer, the, 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 the FIFA game, uh, because it allows you to kick the through ball. The, <laughs> look, look, Hey, bro. I, hey, look, no, look, I'll take the soccer play. Look, I, look, I'll take the soccer fans. I will take the soccer fans over the weird far right people who say there's no space for sports. Oh, 100%. There's something on a visceral Maybe. level. Unless, the, non- Marxist Marxist unless the soccer Maybe. fans are open Marxists, if they're open Marxists, then no. But if they're just 
I just Ladies, have this soccer fans. I, I what I dislike, honestly, what I can't stand, and I'm in this space, and I came in as a sportsman. People go, and I see this all the time because I'm talking about sports guys who sell out, and there is a preponderance of black bourgeoisie and metropolitan omnisexuals across the sports world writ large. Um, but I often see the comment like, "Well, these guys just play a game all day anyway. Well, why does anybody care what they say?" It's like, dude, you're five seven you're fat you haven't seen your cock and you know since you were a kid and you know i mean what are you saying you know what what do you say i mean again hold on and let's be clear let's be clear pursuit of sports it's proper for that to be uh near the top of your high priorities when you're like in high school and if you can transition that to your like 20s like sweet you know like awesome it's the the where the disorder comes in and often due to the money that they make, if they're in a good, if they're in an actual, yeah. you know, competitive sport, um, the disorder comes in that they don't rightly transfer from the bodily excellence to the intellectual excellence, which should be peaking out around 40 to 50. That is the big right? problem. And so yeah. that's, that's a, an error there on the athlete side. That's a huge error. Mm -hmm. But the dude who's, who's 15 years old or their kids are, you know, 15 and, and one eye's a little lazy and they don't play sports and they're like, oh, but I'm a Thomist. You're like, something's off. Yeah, you should. You should. Something's want to be in sports, off, bro. You need yeah, to but, at least. But you need to be to exposing extent, yourself to, to vulnerability. The same extent that what you're saying about a, a teenager that doesn't want to play sports, an American that that follows soccer before basketball and football. Oh, agreed. Those other agreed. Races, I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I already, wrong. I already handled, I already handled the uh, objection of why soccer is where it is in American yeah. sports, I know, then it's right. It's American rightly there. Interest in soccer. Then you it's rightly there. American but no, no, but, but no, I didn't. How do you, no, I didn't. Just, how do you I justified just excellence in soccer? Okay. Let me throw a monkey, which is an American soccer. Let me throw a monkey wrench in my dear two good Catholic friends. How do we, how do we, how do we square baseball? It's a um, pastime. It's erstwhile. It, it was part of the national identity. I, I, I'm not, I'm not a baseball guy, so but, I, I can't, it, it's it was, here. Let's go a little. Let's go a little more fundamental. Americans. It's it's largely it's largely the first advent of the discrete sport competition. So right, you run a play and then you stop, and then you load yeah. up. You run a play. So what it does is it focuses the moment of anxiety, the moment of vulnerability. It it, it nails it down. It, it it makes it more and more fine. That's the reason why football is what it is. Is because. The moment of anxiety is so great in those moments when they play that, you know, in a, a given football game, the, the plays take about five minutes of running time out of 60 minutes and the game right. takes three hours. So it is so intensely focused on that time when it's playing. And so baseball is, is the first iteration of that discrete dynamic of sport where it gets really intense. I mean, there's no doubt about it. These dudes throwing, you know, 90, 100 mile an hour fastball, like, when there's like a high schooler with, with movement there, hey, now with hey, big movement too. When, when there's a high schooler, when there's a high schooler, that's a big recruit, uh, a big baseball recruit and is throwing like 91 miles an hour. You look at it. You're like, do you have a cannon on your arm? Yeah. Like that is a rocket. Yeah. Like you can do that. You can throw a baseball 91 miles an hour. And then for someone to have the hand eye target, coordination on target. And for someone to have the hand eye coordination on the flip side, to be able to, to hit dingers off those, <laughs> like there's something going on, but I mean, baseball, uh, baseball fell victim to the, the, the fact that it, it ushered in the era of then the perfection of the discrete sports like a football to such a, to such a place that it became uh, relatively insignificant, relatively uh, insignificant, which it is relatively speaking. Everyone knows uh, you got a big football game on or a big basketball game on, and you got a, a big baseball game on the viewership. So, tells so, the story. so how does it no, goes no doubt that tells story, but how does baseball, how does it square that baseball still has the highest paid athletes? Oh, the because, they, because they don't have the anti-competitive structures in place with salary caps. That's clear. If America took out salary Are caps, you saying that there's no market, there's no market or viewership that justifies these contracts. Well, there is, but I'm saying it's it's more of an accurate representation, and that's with a smaller market. I'm saying if you took salary caps out with basketball, look at what they did when they raised the salary cap ceiling, and now we've got what 20, 25 players in the NBA making 40 million a year. I've said this to to Royce before. Uh, it's right and fitting that LeBron should probably make somewhere on the, the range, and maybe not now in these latter years, but somewhere in the range of 200 to $300 million a year. No doubt. A year. Just from basketball. I'm not talking endorsements. Disagree. I'm talking from, from basketball. 
Hold on. And, and Kobe should have been even, even more. I'm saying if you took salary caps out of play, yeah. the, the where it would go for the elite players in basketball would fly up. Which is it? Which is, wait, wait. Now, 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 Tim. Now, I have to agree with this. Football is the same thing. Because what, I, what I'm going to say is when I say when I got this video that's out there that many people may have seen or, or you can go find to me talking about LeBron being a sellout and the economic injustice that he yes. has perpetrated in his own individual career by taking this low, low threshold of, of compensation to then also sell out on the social well, issues as well. well that's, the side the, dish. that's the cope. Think about it. If he has to receive an unjust payment in the first place, he's more likely through that wound of injustice to then be, be, be compromised by it and then go seek these petty ways to try and reconcile it. And then it's going to hinder the intellect. Whereas if yep. this man came into the league and within a couple of years, he's making what would have been just for him to make relative to the NBA landscape yes. and the amount of money it draws in and the demands that they would have been able to make against an owner, by the way, that league should have a two tiered league like the European system. So that if a franchise doesn't want to do it, they get, they get demoted. You know what I mean? Like they'll, they're, yeah. they're subject to relegation. Not the sort of all communist, of sudden, all of us rise. Yes. At once all of a sudden, on, based those, on LeBron's like really what they're doing. This is what they do. The, the whole model, the whole basketball, the, the whole basketball related income revenue share model with the ownership is one of the highest forms of anti-competitive business practice, cartel practice. And it's actually a microcosm of what the banks do. And by the way, and by the way, and it's it, actually run by anti-Jews, yes, just like the and, banks are. And, so and, it's, it's, it's really a, a fitting, a fitting representation, which is why the edifice from the central banking cartel favors China the same way the NBA favors China. But, but LeBron what they do is they all milk off of when LeBron comes to town. Yeah. They and, all milk off of oh. the, the, the sale, the, 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 whoever, and that's whoever the star players are, not just LeBron. But for many years, it was LeBron. Like the sales increase for home attendance when LeBron comes to town was exponential versus everybody else on an individual scale. And he knew this, like yeah. this was and commonly no, on, talked on. about in the public. And he took what he should have done as the, the number one voice or, or, leader of the players and athletes all around the world. Cause he was, you know, the NBA's most powerful sports institution in some respects. And he was the most powerful athlete. He should have called for a strike for the way that the, the, the anti-competitive nature of the NBA was set. And yes. he did it. But let's be clear. Let's be and clear. He became woke and it was Trayvon Martin. And it was at that time after Miami yeah. and they had just won and his, in his market, his market was at the all time high and he punted on the economic part. And then he became BLM's uh, water boy. And, and where did, but where did he get his most substantive income from, from endorsement deals? So he was immediately wedded to endorsement deals, uh, their own sort of objectives. Let's be clear about this. When he came into the league, he had a $5 million salary per year for the first like 90 years. million for that, Nike. That, yep. And, and, and when you're 18 years old, I can't imagine the repressive damage that that caused in his own development being 18, 19 years old, probably didn't. I mean, yeah, honestly, like how can someone even, even form in line with that? Whereas guess what? If he comes into the NBA and his salary from the NBA, if, if, if he didn't get drafted, but a team has to go buy the rights to him yep. and then convince him to join their team, they probably would have had to shell out. A hundred, a hundred mil a year, million, yeah. if not more. And guess what? If he's then doing that, his whole instinct toward what he seeks after would be way different, would be so much more in line with reality. If he's making $350 million a year, he doesn't have to go to Nike to try and make up what seems to be a gap in what he's doing and right. what he's accomplishing. That, that, and and there'd be the way, same, but the yeah. crazy thing is it's the same people. So they offer him this, this, yes. this, uh, this, this house of cards here, knowing that he then has to turn to what all athletes consider the greater marketplace of corporate endorsement yeah. to, to fill in what their actual market share worth is. Which and is it, a joke. And, and which which, is and so disorder. Let me tie it all around. And this may be the final. And this is the last yeah, thing yeah. I'll say. I got to go. Because we've been, we've been rolling. But I think this is an important development because it just shows the microcosm. The people who say, oh, these guys get paid just to play a game. Guess what? They're not willing to fight for the value of their own citizenship or marketplace value. They're willing yeah. to allow the Fed to yeah. sell them down the river. It's the same motif. LeBron is a represent is a reflection of the everyday average working man's willingness to punt on fighting for his his share of the American dream, his share of, of his American citizenship for some esoteric, oh, abstract, existential high. And and nail in the coffin, 
which brings us full circle. What do they focus on when they go? Well, yeah, we're trying to. What do they focus on? They go, well, we're trying to in the CBA agreement. What? The CBA keeps this structure totally intact, yeah. and you're trying to. That's not even real, by the way. Like the CBA is like there the should Congress. be promotion. There should be promotion relegation. There should be hands down no draft. Yeah, that that shouldn't even the, enter into the 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 equation. And there should be great players should not even be playing basketball for years if they're not getting that. It should be it should be somewhat of an all or nothing. Like yes, you should be like no, actually on principle, I'm just gonna go get a a job at the at the local you know whatever. Um, rather than play for $5 million when you ought to, and no, you would be paying me $350 million a year. If you guys if, if, that's wise, yeah. if, if we really win, if we really went through this, instead of what they do is they handicap you in the sport. They tether your actual income to that. So now you are, you have to stay in that in order for those things to be there. And now you have to be in this sort of repressive environment here in the sports where what should actually be happening is what you can do in the sport oh, should fine. be the bulk of the income Probably. and then you should be like it should be just yeah obviously like uh nike i don't know do i want to yeah actually the aesthetics of nike are kind of cool sure i'll sign with that but then the second they're like oh but you also have to say but uh no that's not why i'm with you i the swoosh is like a cool uh you know uh, uh yeah cool graphic design like the the designer was really good and like your your shoe your shoe team of of aesthetic people who put these together they're really good i like they look they look cool so that's why i'm with you not um you know not, not, as, not to the entire interest. yeah value or viability yeah. to the entire corporate marketplace yeah. or or my, my market share so, as an athlete so That's i say that because the, the analogy is right we sit there and we go well well yeah the house or you know yeah these elections it's the same thing as the people go well yeah we're trying to in the cba yeah the cba is the sports it's, version of an omnibus yeah it's it's a joke it's a, it's it's a big a joke. it's a so, big nothing burger so first off yeah first off athletes uh, at least some of them it doesn't have to be all of them some of them it has to break through and they, it, this stuff has to click. Oh, and and by the way, a uh, uh, little endorsement for it. Royce and I wrote a co-authored a book, MMA versus NBA, which is actually a treatise of sport um, from the specific. Somewhere. Yep. Yeah. The continuous versus discrete. That's one of the, the foundational chapters. And then we talk about league structure, promotion, relegation, and this principle of anti-competitiveness. It's not even that long. It's about, you know, it's pages. about 85 pages. Yeah. Um, yeah, where can, it where says, can the people get that book? Amazon. Can you get that on Amazon. Yeah, I, I yeah, yeah. Amazon. Copy Amazon. Right. But I'm saying it, it only so needs published. it only needs not to, an yep. endorsement of Jeff Bezos yeah, yeah, or no. Amazon. It it uh, it only needs to be a, a few good athletes that that starts to break through intellectually, and then a few others, and they'd be able to make those moves easy, and that would be the actual reform. And, and, and the last thing is to I'll say is so. well, you know what I really hate is when people go, well, why would our athletes be? I don't look to my athletes to lead me. This is another conservative LARPy little cuck move that I see a lot online. Well, I don't look at athletes to lead me. And I actually see this on the rising up on the liberal woke progressive side too, is well, we shouldn't be looking at our black athletes to lead us anywhere. These celebrities, they're all, they're all using that as, as a justification for their own sellout impetus, right? Is, is, you know, no, you should call the people that you give money to, to entertain you, but also look to as some, uh, let's, let's call it a, a false catharsis, you know, a, a break from reality, which is the real corrupt part, but no, you should look for these people to have a moral, a moral, uh, a, a, a moral edifice that, that reflects on your own. If not, that's the sellout. You're a sellout. If you buy and purchase a product from people that doesn't reflect your own. I mean, this is the depth uh, when we talk about globalism, this is where they're ahead of us. They're laughing in Davos. They're like, all of the, all of you guys are virtue signaling because all of you have vice and money and, and convenience and all these things way ahead of your morals. So you and, and the Catholic, the Catholics too, in many respects, right. And many in our own community, you all have all of this, you know, you can talk all, you know, this is why Kissinger and these guys walk around with this, with this holier than thou, you know, chest yeah, out yeah. mentality. Because they're like, we, we see the real truth, the truth you don't want to accept. You guys are bought in. You bought into it. Even your conservatives who act like they're the opposition, they bought in. They're on the, they're on the come. They're on the take. They can talk about Christianity and nationalism and all that all they want to. But there's still Republicans that like the low-cost labor from the southern border. There's still Republicans that like a, a, a hit of cocaine on Wall Street. There's still the Republicans that enjoy uh, this sort of, you know, uh, convolent, weird uh, uh, ethno uh, trade agreement with the Canadians and the French and the, and the English. Right. So th there's still that out there. 
So are who are you people really, right? Who are you really? Who are you saying you are and who are you really? But the sports is a great microcosm of it because as, as much as people want to say, oh, LeBron's a sellout, the, the NBA audience isn't just black people. Now it's about 45% black people, no doubt. Uh, but it isn't just black people. The rest of it is, is mostly middle white America. And the NFL is predominantly white, middle white America. And, and it's the same thing. The NFL is woke. They're bending right now to transgenderism and LGBTQ. And remember they had the guy come out and sing the national anthem who was gay. So, so why aren't, why aren't people boycotting the NFL? Right. If, yeah. if, if you're going to say that you don't want your Colin Kaepernick's to, to go woke and try so, and kneel about police brutality. Why don't you, why don't you kneel when, why don't you kneel when they, when they have a, a gay guy come out and sing the national anthem or, or why don't you kneel when, uh, when, uh, when they fly the F 16s over, like they're honoring the, the, the military industrial complex. Why don't you boycott for that reason? Most of you people are just aren't willing to boycott anything. You're, you're cucks. You're bought in, you're on the take. So let's just be clear about that. Redeem, oh, come back from that, and then we can move forward. That's the first war, cuckism. Cuckism is the first war that must be fought ideologically. And I'm not talking about for women. It, it, it's for women, but first it's for the institution. We're cucks for the institutions. And uh, to bring this full circle, actually, because the reason we were talking about D1 sports in, in specific, or this is what got down this tangent about the leagues, is there should be promotion relegation all the way down. So even if you're at the bottom of that totem pole, but you're in that continuum, it would be a legitimate position. That's where like a, a D3, if it were just on this totem pole of promotion relegation, it would be fitting. It would be resonant. It would be appropriate. The way it is right now, cut off from everything. And even what they do with, with uh, D1 sports to a degree is, is a, a joke. It's a travesty, right? It doesn't, it doesn't Damn. resonate rightly, you know? So um, yeah, that, that's that answer that, that at least brings that part full circle. But um, obviously we, you know, we got to call it at this point. Um, <laughs> I'm, I just got to throw that in there and uh, I'll say, uh, you know, I'll give I'll start with my parting shot and uh, I'll say, you know, study up on, on the mechanics of divine providence, how it works all things to the ultimate end, because it uses proximate ends to do it. And it uses people targeting proximate ends. And I think this is the answer, uh, Tim, circling all the way back to the beginning with uh, with with the question of Benedict, with the question of Francis, the modernists, yet they they all have their proximate ends that they're working toward. And certain ones of them are bringing about real evils. They're real concerted evils. And uh, a conversation like this is just starting to sort of pierce that bubble of the different layers where we should rightly be um, putting our focus on what is our actual foreign policy right here at home. How, how are these dynamics actually going, which align with justice or injustice, right? Um, in, in the case of the church, what things are, are, are coming about to direct it toward these other ends, which serve as a sign of contradiction, which actually clarify for people, what role do, do commentators like ourselves, like you, Tim, uh, Royce, definitely play in the process of bringing about that crystallization, which is real. I'm not the person who goes, oh, on account of this, anyone who's criticizing it shouldn't have a voice. Like, actually, they should probably have more of one and they should probably go even harder on their position mm -hmm. um, because whatever they're saying that that is good and needs to come out, needs to come out. And uh, they're, they're too being moved by, by the, the divine hand of God. So um, study up on that. I would say uh, a real, a real area, insight for people if they're, they're struggling. Tim, you'll be able to attest to this with your Aristotelian background. A real area where people will... We'll, we'll be able to find that there's a, an error lurking beneath the surface it has to do with intention and, and moral acts. Mm. Uh, many people have separated out grave matter and intent. And in a moral act, uh, the end or the object is the intent. It's, it's equivalent with the intent. So it's a, it's a non-distinction when people make that, that out. And so I, I know this will seem kind of abstract or random to people, but um, guess what? You actually have to sort out the fact that like murder comes from the intent to kill someone. It doesn't come from the fact of whether you use a gun or a knife or a sword or a rope or whatever else. Uh, the end, the intent is equivalent with the object, with the grave matter. Um, and so uh, again, this is all about, you have to get this clarified so that you can understand sin rightly, so that you can understand uh, divine providence rightly. Um, and then you start to see how, no, yeah, people have their proximate ends they're going toward, right? That is the, the purpose of what they're going to. And by the way, in a moral act, that is the object of their act. The object is not the color of the thing they're looking at or some other thing. It is the, the thing they're aiming at. 
And God in providence directs all those things toward uh, the divine ends. And, and one thing I'm not going to, I'm not going to punt on the justice of God uh, because I get cold feet over some bad things that are stirring up. Uh, and that may stir up on, on a much longer scale than, uh, you know, 10 years, 50, 100 years. It could be much longer than that. Um, but I'm not getting cold feet and going to go, well, I guess I'm not actually sure if God's justice is at work here. It, you know, St. Augustine would never have done it. If someone goes, well, you know, but what about blank? St. You know, they, they, the one, and I'm throwing another tangent out here at you, but uh, both of you guys, but uh, <laughs> the one that goes, well, what about uh, the, the firstborn who were killed uh, with, with the Egyptians? Like, how is that just, you know? And, and, and they're like, St. Augustine, won't you punt on, on God's justice now? And he goes, uh, no, first off, the children were either a punishment to the parent, um, which it is, by the way, if you're a parent and you lost your child, uh, that would cause pain, which be a, which by the way, is the sort of medium of punishment. Um, so it is effectively a punishment to the parent. Oh, and for that kid, um, here's, he goes, here's the, here's the potential mercy in it. One of two things, either that kid received grace, uh, to, to endure that punishment with their eyes still turned toward God, even in that sort of infantile state, however we can imagine it. And, and, uh, they go on to heaven or, or there's actually mercy in that because had they grown up in the lineage they were going to grow up in, they were going to mount way more mortal sins um, and, and actual sins than what they have now. And so uh, their, 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 their divine end on account of it um, is actually much tempered from what it, it would have been. Mm-hmm. And, and the saints early on throughout the age, they say that. They say, why does mortal sin de- deserve an eternal punishment? Well, because uh, in one consideration, uh, if they weren't to have died, they would have continued on for, in their mortal sin for all eternity. Um, in another uh, consideration, um, you know, Again, if they weren't to have died, uh, they just they go on in in this sort of line of thought, and that is the right way to always sort of understand God's justice. That it it works in that sort of based of a way. It's that savage of a way. Like no, even you, what you think is your slam dunk case, um, not even close to derailing the the justice of God. Not even close, nor the mercy. And um, so, that that would be my my parting tome right there. Mom. My, my part of the shot is one definition. Cuckism. <laughs> the predominant socio-psychological phenomenon by which men have gradually conceded their manhood to women in pursuit of affirmation or intimacy, causing a species-wide epidemic of self-doubt and worldwide distortion of society through real politic in the 21st century. Don't die a jerk-off. Don't die a cuck. Amen. Well, uh... All right. Thank you guys for joining today. God bless you both. And we will uh, we'll see you next time that you you join us for a, a rangy discussion on rules <laughs> for retrogrades. Everyone like subscribe, click the notification bell and we'll, we'll, we'll see you next time. God bless you all. And Deus Vol. Now, I don't know if this is going to end the conversation or end the recording. If it does, it should just end the recording. We went, we went way out there on this one. That one was fun, guys. <laughs> that one was deep. I felt like gonna... Tim was over there for about an hour just sitting there. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, all I see is end meeting. Hold on. Where do I end, uh, end recording? The, on the actual record button, that one that was like three in from it. I can see the comments now. Why is Tim Not on the top. It's going to be on the bottom part. Why oh, there is it is. Tim, why is Tim...